Uh-oh. Something is nearing the surface of the planet. It looks like a fireball hurtling closer and closer at a truly incredible speed. Soon, it becomes obvious that the collision is inevitable. Bam! The impact leaves a huge crater. It evaporates thousands of cubic miles of solid rock, and it also sets off a series of terrible natural disasters. Yeah, I know what you're thinking. You believe I'm talking about the catastrophic collision that occurred around 66 million years ago on Earth. You know, the one that's responsible for the extinction of non-avian dinosaurs and three-quarters of other life forms on our planet? But no, the disaster I'm talking about happened on a different planet. Scientists think that our close neighbor, Mars, once experienced the same catastrophe that struck Earth. It happened around 3.4 billion years ago. An asteroid collision might have caused a mega tsunami on the red planet, similar to the one that caused the Chicxulub impact on Earth. Scientists have identified an impact crater on Mars that was probably left by a comet or asteroid collision with the surface of the planet. Most likely, the space body landed in an ocean in the Martian northern lowlands, and the impact was so powerful that it caused a mega tsunami. Before the latest studies, the exact location of the impact crater wasn't verified. It was just a theory. To confirm it, a team of astronomers simulated a comet and asteroid collision in the area where they supposed the impact crater was. They even named this crater Paul. Paul is 68 miles across and lies in a region that is almost 400 feet below the supposed sea level. Anyway, the simulations form several craters of the same size as Paul. One of the simulations claimed that these craters had been left by a 5-mile-wide asteroid that had encountered strong ground resistance. The other simulation showed that the craters had been caused by a bit smaller asteroid that met a weaker ground resistance. But according to both simulations, the impact crater was almost 70 miles in diameter, and the collisions produced mega tsunamis up to 900 miles away from the center of the impact site. The simulations also help scientists estimate the height of the tsunami. It was about 820 feet tall, almost as tall as the Eiffel Tower. The authors of the study also suggest that the Pole Crater might be similar to the Chicxulub impact crater on our planet. The Chicxulub asteroid, as we now know it, is believed to come from the outer reaches of the solar system. This space body was at least 6 miles across. It crashed into the shallow seawaters near the Yucatan Peninsula. This splashdown was so powerful that it left its signature on the entire face of the planet. In 2021, researchers found out that the collision had carved mega-ripples into Earth's crust in the region of modern-day central Louisiana. An even newer study suggests that the asteroid also triggered a tsunami so devastating it eroded seafloor sediments half a world away. The team of scientists remodeled the events of the first 10 minutes after the impact, and the model showed that the asteroid had produced waves up to 30,000 times greater than one of the largest tsunamis people have ever recorded, the Indian Ocean tsunami that hit Indonesia in 2004. The collision displaced so much water that it created a wave almost a mile high. That's like two Burj Khalifas, which is the tallest construction in the world, stacked one on top of the other. And of course, all that empty space didn't stay empty for long. The ocean gushed back to fill the crater. But in the process, it only ricocheted off the crater's rim, which produced even more waves. After that, Tsunami waves that were more than 33 feet tall traveled around the world at a speed of 3 feet per second, lashing at all coastlines on their way. Imagine a three-story building rushing up to you. No wonder the largest and fastest-moving waves occurred near the impact area in the open waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Those rose more than 330 feet tall, which is taller than the Statue of Liberty, and moved at a speed 10 times greater than more distant tsunami waves. But back to the red planet. Some experts think that not one, but two mega tsunamis could happen on Mars. They could be triggered by a pair of meteor impacts that were several millions of years apart. Between these two collisions, Mars went through a period of climate changes. As a result, liquid water on its surface turned into ice. In other words, the first asteroid impact most likely produced waves composed of liquid water. 
and the second tsunami was probably formed by rounded chunks of ice water. By the way, the largest asteroid to have ever crashed into Earth might not actually be the one that ended dinosaurs. A much more catastrophic collision likely happened about 3.5 billion years ago. New evidence scientists found in northwestern Australia suggests that the asteroid I'm talking about was 12 to 18 miles across. It struck Earth at an immense speed, releasing an unimaginable amount of energy. Now, this made me think. What if something like that happened these days? More than 30,000 objects that are circling Earth these days could potentially crash into our planet. NASA considers around 1,500 of them to be potentially hazardous. These space rocks are the remains left after the solar system was formed some 4.6 billion years ago. For example, in 2004, astronomers discovered a huge asteroid nearing Earth. The first observation showed that the chance of the space rock hitting our planet was less than 3%. The asteroid was named Apophis. It's more than 1,200 feet across and weighs about 20 million tons. It's supposed to streak across the sky on April 13, 2029. Apophis will pass at a distance of 19,000 miles away from Earth's surface. But even though the space rock might miss our planet in 2029, it doesn't mean it won't return 15 years later in 2036. If such an object hits our planet, the consequences will be unpredictable. They can vary from shattered glass and broken windows to most life forms getting wiped off the face of the Earth. And it'll probably affect the internet. Now that last thought is truly scary. But luckily, modern technologies are likely to help us avoid any catastrophic consequences. Experts have developed several ways to prevent a real-life disaster movie from happening. For one thing, we could use a spacecraft to knock this visitor from outer space off its course. Or it could somehow be blasted into pieces. Scientists could also slow the thing down with the help of concentrated sunlight. Or people could tug it away with a gravity tractor. That's a theoretical spacecraft that can influence objects in space without touching them. In sci-fi movies, a huge asteroid often sneaks up on Earth and turns out to be a nasty surprise to astronomers. It hurtles toward our planet at breakneck speed and gets discovered just weeks or even days before the collision. In reality, scientists are constantly watching all large objects in Earth's neighborhood. It means there would be plenty of time to do something before the inevitable happened. There are three kinds of missions scientists could prepare at short notice. Type 0, when a heavy spacecraft hurdles toward the intruder with one single goal, to knock it off its course. In this case, astronomers would have to rely on the already available information. The Type 1 mission would involve a scout. It would be launched first to get more close-up information about the space rock. Only after that, the main spacecraft would be launched. With more precise information, its journey would be way more productive. And if scientists chose the Type 2 mission, they would send a scout and a small spacecraft at the same time. The spacecraft would knock the asteroid a bit off its course. Then the scout would collect all the necessary information. Based on this data, the spacecraft would finish its job with a more fine-tuned second push. If none of these methods work, people could try going deep underground or even build a shelter on the ocean floor. But in this case, we'd need to find sources of energy that could help us survive for at least several decades. Plus, people would have to create a life support system that could somehow keep air and water fresh. Asteroids flying around is sometimes like a fierce game of dodgeball, where you never know when some of them can go in your direction. So we can just track the situation and hope for the best. To figure out the risk, scientists from different organizations have to study the positions and paths of the asteroids that come close to our planet, especially those that are at least 0.6 miles wide. And the good news is that none of these asteroids will probably hit us for at least the next 1,000 years. Phew! To give us an idea of their power, scientists did an experiment to simulate the impact of such a gigantic asteroid. The energy released from the collision would be a mind-blowing 100,000 megatons. That's like detonating 15,000 tons of dynamite. Also, if such a big asteroid hit us, Earth would cool down significantly because of all that debris that would go into the atmosphere and block sunlight. Plants wouldn't be able to get their fuel in this case, 
so we'd all be in trouble, both humans and animals. Thankfully, such mammoth asteroid impacts are quite rare. The larger an asteroid, the longer it takes it to collide with Earth. For example, it's estimated that asteroids with diameters of at least 0.6 miles strike our planet about once every 700,000 years. And if we're talking about even bigger ones that are 3 miles wide, well, those are predicted to come crashing down only once every 30 million years. Yay! But hold on. Don't get too relaxed just yet. Astronomers focus on really large asteroids because those are the ones that can kind of doom our planet if they hit us. Yep, you got it right. In a dinosaur kind of way. Even if one of them didn't erase us completely, the damage would still be enormous. So, there are still some asteroids wandering around that we need to keep an eye on to see how they might evolve over time. Scientists have a model of tracking them where they focus on the parts of an asteroid's path that come close to our planet to see if the space rock poses a risk to us. And it seems there might be one asteroid, 7482, 1994 PC1, 3,600 feet in diameter that might pose some danger. It's supposed to come closer to our planet in the next 1,000 years. And when I say risky, it means there's a 0.0151% chance of it coming within one Earth-Moon distance. It already passed by us in 2022, but we were lucky because it was far enough 1.2 million miles. I'd say we can relax when it comes to asteroid scenarios. For now, asteroids slamming into Earth would be new for humankind, but not for the planet itself. As I said, there weren't many of those big ones, but they still had enormous consequences. The first one that comes to most people's minds is, of course, the dinosaur asteroid as big as a mountain that struck our home planet around 66 million years ago near Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula. It was chaotic. Global firestorms and tsunamis were all over the place. Dust was blocking out the sun, and vaporized rock released sulfur, which then led to acid rain and the acidification of the oceans. But there was an even bigger fella that came before that one. Around two billion years ago, a gigantic asteroid crashed into our planet and left a massive crater in South Africa. The one we know today as the Redifort Crater. And it seems this asteroid might have been even bigger than we all originally thought. Twice as wide as the space rock that erased dinosaurs. The Redifor Crater is confirmed to be the biggest visible crater on Earth, with a diameter of about 99 miles. It used to be even bigger when it first formed, though. Maybe even 155 to 174 miles across. It's hard to figure out its true size because the crater has been eroding for the past 2 billion years. Think of it like slicing off layers from the rim of a bowl. The diameter gets smaller with each slice. When the asteroid, 7 or 5 miles wide, that wiped away dinosaurs hit Earth about 66 million years ago, it caused massive destruction. Forest fires, acid rain, tsunamis, and so much ash and dust that it changed Earth's climate. This all made about 75% of life on our planet extinct. The asteroid that created the Redifort crater was not only bigger, but it also traveled at a higher speed which means the consequences there would have been even worse. But it happened a long time ago, and living beings were different back then. Maybe it was some bacteria that didn't even notice that something unusual was happening. Earth is not the only one. Lots of impacts have happened across our solar system too. For example, in our close neighborhood. Yup, moving to Mercury and its massive crater called the Caloris Basin. It measures about 950 miles across, which is more than the state of Texas. There's a ring of towering mountains around the crater which makes it look even more impressive. You can see different colors in the mosaic image of the Caloris Basin. They tell us more about the geology of the basin. The orange parts represent lava that once flooded the basin. These lava flows covered the original surface and added this specific orange hue. And after the lava flooded the basin on Mercury, smaller craters formed on top of the lava surface. These craters dug into the ground and uncovered the material hidden beneath the lava. Some of this material is blue in color. And this blue stuff could be a clue about what the original floor of the basin had looked like before the lava covered it. Venus, the hottest planet in our solar system, has a thick atmosphere that comes with a pretty good defense system against space rocks. It's so dense that it burns up most meteors before they even reach its surface. As a result, you won't see as many visible craters on Venus as on other rocky planets in our solar system. But Venus still has some scars that can tell us about some serious impacts that happened there. And one of the biggest scars we know about is Mead Crater. It's enormous, about 170 miles in diameter. The inner floor of this crater is relatively flat and kind of brighter than its surroundings. 
It's possible that the crater ended up filled with a mixture of melted rock after the impact, and maybe even lava from volcanic activity on Venus. Want to get an idea of what Earth might look like without its protective layer called atmosphere? Just take a look at the moon. Its surface is littered with impact craters. This Tycho is one of the craters you'll easily notice on the moon. When you look at the full moon, you can spot it as a distinct circle with bright rays that radiate outward, slightly off-center on the lower left side of the moon. This crater, 53 miles wide, has a beautiful central peak in the middle that's topped with an intriguing boulder. The size of this boulder is impressive. It would fill about half of a typical city block here on Earth. When talking about craters, we definitely can't leave out Mars. The red planet has a much thinner atmosphere than Earth. When spacecraft approach Mars, they rely on the planet's atmosphere to slow them down as they enter it. And indeed, the atmosphere helps slow spacecraft down during landing. But it's still not thick enough to completely protect Mars from all those space rocks that are coming all the time. From July to September 2018, a dark spot appeared on the southern pole of Mars. It consists of two distinct patterns. A theory says that the bigger, lighter colored blast pattern can be the result of an impact shock wave scouring the ice surface. The impact generated winds that spread out and scoured the ice. The inner blast pattern, which is darker in color, occurred because the impacting object managed to penetrate the thin ice layer. As it hit the surface, it sent dark sand and debris flying in all directions. The problem with that asteroid that destroyed dinosaurs was not that it fell, but where it fell. This colossal space rock found the worst place where it could land. Also, the angle at which it hit the ground was the most unfortunate. If it had fallen vertically, there would have been less destruction. But it fell at such an angle that it threw a huge amount of dust into the air. After the disaster occurred, tons of soot started burning. 65 million years ago, only 13% of Earth's surface contained the right amount of sulfur and oil needed to form a colossal amount of soot. If the asteroid had fallen on the other 87% of the territory, dinosaurs could still be living today, but it hit the worst place and lifted a million tons of burning material into the sky. A cloud of incandescent particles covered the sky and set off on a journey across the mainland. Then, these particles settled on the ground and caused large-scale fires. Trees were burning and sending more soot into the sky. But the asteroid collided not only with rocks, it fell on the coast in a place where the seabed was filled with sulfate. As a result of the collision, it started burning, which caused the release of sulfuric acid into the atmosphere. The air became poisoned. It seems the dinosaurs didn't stand a chance. And now, let's imagine the asteroid falling in another place, somewhere in the middle of the ocean. Huge waves flooded part of the land, but almost all kinds of dinosaurs survived, or even better. The rock could have fallen somewhere in the desert and left behind a giant crater. That's all. Yes, several dinosaurs passing by wouldn't have survived the collision, but the situation wouldn't have been so critical in general. So, giant lizards remain dominant on our planet. They don't allow other animals to develop since Tyrannosaurus and other ferocious reptiles hunt mammoths and other ancient creatures. The population of mammals is decreasing, Velociraptors are fighting for territories with saber-toothed tigers and giant bears. A struggle for survival between dinosaurs and other animals begins. Then, the Ice Age comes, and some reptiles don't survive. Then, new players enter the field. Those are humans' early ancestors. Living side by side with dinosaurs is difficult. Lizards attack settlements and caves, so people have to build high walls for protection. By the way, the Tyrannosaurus poses less danger to people than you might have thought. According to the latest research, many creatures were able to run away from this monster. Yes, you probably saw how easily they caught up with cars in the movies, but it wouldn't be as scary in reality. Paleontologists and biologists have analyzed the strength of dino's bones and found out that the creature couldn't reach high speeds. The maximum it was capable of was running twice as slow as a field athlete. Thousands of years have passed. People have learned to live with dinosaurs. They've even managed to tame some lizards. They've domesticated herbivorous dinosaurs to develop agriculture. Triceratopses and bulls now plow fields together. Imagine farms swarming with Diplodocuses or Brachiosauruses. People climb their long necks and pick fruit from high trees. 
Stegosauruses protect pastures from wolves and velociraptors. Dinosaurs with shells, such as ankylosauruses, help people across deserts. They, along with camels and donkeys, carry heavy loads. People share the planet with ancient lizards and live in harmony. The situation in the seas and oceans is much worse. Sea reptiles attack wooden ships and catch all the fish. Imagine that you're sailing to another continent with tons of grain, fabrics, fur, and other goods. And then a giant mosasaur appears on the horizon. It's one of the most powerful sea lizards. A great white shark looks like a small fish next to it. The creature could easily defeat a megalodon. And then it comes across a wooden ship. It bites into the deck and pulls the whole boat underwater. Water dinosaurs are the main obstacle to communication between countries. This slows the progress down for a hundred years. People built metal ships to withstand the attacks of the Mosasaur. And finally, they managed to establish sea connections. A similar problem occurs when the first planes take off into the sky. Imagine you're flying on a passenger Boeing. You look out of the window and see a pterodactyl. Ah, wait, it's impossible. These winged lizards aren't so fast, but they can catch up with a helicopter or some old biplanes. This poses a serious threat to flights, so people install sound protection systems on board each aircraft. Pterodactyls hear irritating ultrasound from a distance and fly as far away from it as possible. People equip submarines and ships with the same sound shields. Then, after people have learned how to defend themselves from dinosaurs, another problem appears. Lizards are the kings of wildlife, so they displace all other animal species. Dinosaurs run across African savannas, and lizards with fur live in cold winter forests. Lions, wolves, and bears are not the rulers of the wild. Rhinos fight with parasaurolophuses. Stegosauruses attack hippos and take away their territories. Venomous dinosaurs live in jungles. Lizards that can climb trees scare monkeys. Imagine a reptilian ape jumping from one branch to another. To save regular animals from extinction, people have to control the population of predatory reptiles. Huge parks and nature reserves appear in all countries. People transport dinosaurs there and separate them from other wildlife. Dinosaurs seem to be completely under control. When the danger caused by giant reptiles passes, people begin to breed smaller, harmless lizards. Someone buys a chameleon, and someone keeps a microceratus at home. There are dinosaur exhibitions. People take these creatures for a walk as if they were dogs. Some people take selfies with reptiles, go shopping, and sit in cafes with small lizards. Dinosaurs aren't formidable now. They're kind of cute. People ride horses, camels, parasaurolophuses, and pachycephalosauruses. Of course, many have tried to tame velociraptors, but failed. Those are dangerous reptiles and they don't know how to obey. Taming them is almost as difficult as taming an alligator. But dogs and cats are still more popular because they're more intelligent. The brain of a dinosaur is almost as same as that of a chicken. But who knows, if they had lived to this day, perhaps they would have evolved into smarter creatures. Just imagine if dinos were intelligent. In this case, people would have a big problem. Some scientists think that even if a meteorite hadn't destroyed the dinosaurs, they wouldn't have survived to this day. They needed to carry their own colossal weight at all times. It was an enormous load on their bones and joints. Most dinosaurs wouldn't have been able to survive the Ice Age with such characteristics, but smaller lizards might have succeeded. Fast and agile dinosaurs, such as Velociraptors and Pachycephalosauruses, would have survived. But in what form? Could dinosaurs have already evolved into something else? Look at the good old chicken. Many scientists believe it's a direct descendant of the formidable Tyrannosaurus. Somewhere deep inside the bird's DNA, there are genes that the dinosaur had. Yep, it's hard to believe, but look at the chicken's body structure and how it walks. Remove the plumage, cover the creature with scales, and give it toothy jaws instead of a beak. And now, you have a mini T-Rex in the coop. And by the way, not only chickens might be the relatives of giant lizards, many birds are dinosaurs' living descendants. Surprisingly, alligators, snakes, crocodiles, and monitor lizards are not as close to ancient reptiles as pelicans, storks, and other flying creatures. 
Over millions of years of evolution, the paws of dinosaurs turned into wings, and toothy elongated jaws ended up as beaks. The genetics of birds is the key to understanding dinosaurs. Pelicans are similar to pterodactyls, ostriches to velociraptors. Perhaps many other animals also share some genes with ancient lizards. If the meteorite hadn't fallen, all dinosaurs would have evolved into completely different, unusual creatures. Scientists want to carefully study the DNA of birds and try to reverse evolution with the help of genetic engineering. They hope to breed dinosaurs out of eggs one day. But to do this, they need to find a specific genome that hasn't changed over tens of millions of years. It hides in the DNA. And it's not so easy to find it and extract it. Do you think we will see powerful reptiles by 2050? About 800,000 years ago, I wasn't around then, a gigantic asteroid soared through space and plummeted toward Earth. It slammed into our planet with enormous force. It blanketed 10% of Earth with shiny black and green lumps of rocky debris, known as tektites. Tektites are pieces of rock that get liquefied by the heat of a meteorite impact. Then they cool down to look like dark, glassy pebbles. A trail of these tektites was strewn across Southeast Asia and reached all the way to eastern Antarctica. This is how scientists know this giant meteorite crash happened. Well, researchers spent nearly a hundred years trying to find the gigantic crater caused by the impact. But tektites were too widespread. That's why they couldn't pinpoint the exact location. Until recently. A team of experts from different universities tried to discover the ground zero of the meteorite impact. They investigated several craters in China and Cambodia, but none seemed to be created by a meteorite crash. The experts then decided to investigate Laos. It's a country where they discovered the largest and most concentrated number of tektites. After ruling out all visible craters, the team came up with a new theory. What if the crater is hidden by something? In search of the potential crater, the scientists measured gravity readings at different locations all across Laos. At the side of an ancient volcanic eruption, below thick, dense layers of cooled volcanic lava, they discovered a severe gravitational anomaly. Ooh. It turned out to be a large, elongated crater, over 300 feet deep and spreading 8 miles wide and 11 miles long. Based on the location and the crater's enormous size, scientists believe this is the impact site of the ancient meteorite. Meanwhile, over 2 billion years ago, long before the age of dinosaurs, Earth was struck by one of the largest asteroids to ever hit our planet. The asteroid was approximately 6 to 9 miles across and created the biggest impact crater on Earth. This is the Vredefort crater. You can find it in present-day South Africa. When it was formed, it had a gigantic diameter of 186 miles. Over the centuries, the massive crater slowly eroded away into the Vredefort Dome. That's a rocky hill formation that was the central side of the asteroid's impact. This formation is so large that it can be seen from space. Today, the Verita Fort Dome is a recognized World Heritage Site. It's also home to several towns and communities that encourage tourists to come and visit the ancient crater. In 1943, one pilot strayed from his regular flight path to avoid dangerous weather conditions. Flying over Quebec, Canada, he spotted a large, perfectly circular basin. That is how the Pingualuit Crater was discovered. Around 1.4 million years ago, a meteorite hit this spot, creating this small but deep impact crater. It has a diameter of 2 miles and a depth of 1,300 feet. A lake of deep blue water has formed at the bottom of the crater. It's said that this lake contains some of the purest water in the world as it has no inlets or outlets. It means that the lake is only filled by rains and melting snow. The lake is home to one species of fish, the Arctic char. The Sudbury Basin is also in Canada. Formed over 1.8 billion years ago, it's one of the largest and oldest impact craters in the world. It's located in Ontario, but the impact from the collision was so powerful that debris from it was found 500 miles away in Minnesota. Unlike most impact craters that have a circular shape, the Sudbury Basin is an oval. It's 39 miles long with a width of 19 miles. The original impact site might have been a whopping 10 miles deep, but its modern-day version is much shallower. The asteroid that created the basin carried a high concentration of natural minerals. This made the soil in the crater incredibly fruitful. Today, its floor is home to numerous fruit and vegetable farms. 
The unique crater formation of Sudbury Basin was used to train Apollo astronauts before they embarked on their missions to the moon. Perhaps the most famous meteorite of all is the Chicxulub. That's the meteorite responsible for wiping out 75% of all plant and animal life on Earth, including the dinosaurs. The Chicxulub meteorite had a diameter of 6 miles when it struck Earth 66 million years ago. The crater now lies off the coast of Mexico, hidden deep beneath the seabed. It's around 93 miles across and 12 miles in depth. Recently, scientists managed to drill deep down into the highest peak of the impact crater to collect rock samples. They discovered that the disappearance of dinosaurs wasn't caused by the giant size of the meteorite or the scale of the blast. It was because of the exact location where the Chicxulub hit Earth. The meteorite struck part of our planet that was densely filled with a mineral compound called gypsum. It's a soft sulfate mineral that is typically used as a fertilizer. The collision blasted so much sulfur into the air that it blocked out the sun. This caused the prolonged dark winter that doomed the dinosaurs. One of the youngest craters on Earth is the Behringer Crater in Winslow, Arizona. The Behringer Crater is also one of the best preserved craters on Earth. It was formed 50,000 years ago when a heavy meteorite made mostly of iron plummeted down from space. Earth's atmosphere barely slowed down the massive chunk of metal. It collided with the ground with incredible force. The meteorite vaporized upon impact, leaving very few remains. The crater left by this powerful explosion was named after the man who identified it in 1903. It was a mining engineer named Daniel Behringer. The diameter of the crater is 3,900 feet, and it goes 560 feet deep. The Behringer family still owns the impact site to this day. You can visit the crater and take a guided tour around its rim. The Papagai Crater in Siberia is one of the most interesting craters on Earth. An asteroid impact over 35 million years ago formed this massive basin. The crater is 62 miles across, which makes it the fourth largest one in the world. This crater is unique as it's home to one of the largest diamond deposits in the world. The intense pressure from the collision transformed the graphite at the impact site into diamonds. Scientists say that the crater contains trillions of carats of diamonds. But no one has ever mined them due to the site's remote location and lack of infrastructure. In the year 1530 BCE, a meteoroid entered Earth's atmosphere before shattering into pieces. The meteorite's burning fragments rained down on Earth and crashed into the planet's surface. As a result, a group of craters appeared on a small Estonian island, Sarama. The largest crater is a 360-foot-wide perfect circle. It's 70 feet deep and filled with blue water. Eight smaller craters that appeared during the collision can be found within a half-mile radius of the largest crater. The impact of the meteorite fragments caused the trees on the islands to catch fire. Almost all forests burned down. Luckily, the woodlands have now grown back, and the craters are a popular hiking destination for tourists. A meteorite struck the area we now know as Quebec, Canada, around 200 million years ago. This collision created the sixth largest impact crater in the world. It had a diameter of 40 miles. Over the century, the outer rim of the crater has filled up with water. It's now known as Manicougan Reservoir. The impact crater lake is so large it can be seen from space. And its strange shape gave the lake its nickname, the Eye of Quebec. The oldest meteorite crater in the world is in Western Australia. The Yarrabooba Crater is 2.2 billion years old. Well, that gets my vote for the best crater name. The impact site is so ancient that the original crater has completely eroded away. Yarrabooba's diameter was around 19 to 43 miles. Scientists managed to figure out the age of the impact site by analyzing the ancient crystals and minerals found within the crater. You look up and see a bright orange flash in the sky. A bit later, you hear a boom so loud, the window panes around you burst into pieces. And then you see it. A giant piece of space rock burning high above your head, heading for Earth. When it touches the surface, the explosion leaves behind an enormous crater. It's 12 miles deep and as wide as Lake Michigan. After that, three-quarters of all living organisms on our planet are on the edge of survival. This event took place about 66 million years ago. And the bright flash in the sky was the very asteroid that wiped out the dinosaurs. These days, people have many ways to protect themselves. Like we could hide in bunkers deep underground and survive. 
Such bunkers would already come in handy, since there are many asteroids in the sky. And some of them are just waiting for their ticket to Earth to wreak some havoc. For example, the asteroid 1990 MU. In 2027, it'll come alarmingly close to our planet. Many people fear that Earth's gravitational pull will trap the rock, which is the size of two Brooklyn bridges. In this case, it'll start to move closer and eventually crash into the planet's surface. Such an impact would cause a shock wave that would be felt on other continents. Once the asteroid hit the ground, there would be an explosion. It'd be so bright, people would think a new sun appeared right here on Earth. The collision would release a huge amount of energy that would then turn into heat. Everything around the impact site would catch fire. And if the asteroid fell in the water, it would cause tsunami waves higher than the Empire State Building. Many coastal cities would be flooded. The dust that would rise after the explosion would cover the sun. The world would be plunged into darkness. If the dust stayed in the air long enough, the climate on the planet would change and Earth would start to freeze. If you think such a small meteorite can't cause serious damage, look at the Chayabins meteor. It hit the Earth in the winter of 2013. When the space rock entered the atmosphere, people miles away heard a loud bang. The brightly burning object was approaching the surface at about 11 miles per second. Halfway through the flight, it split into several pieces. This caused several stronger shock waves. When the meteorites hit the ground, it caused a major earthquake. And the aftershock from the explosions shattered the windows of 5,000 buildings. People in six cities around the crash site felt the aftereffects of the fall. And this meteorite was only 60 feet wide. Fortunately, the asteroid 1990 MU will move past our planet. We'll be safe. Whew! But the next asteroid to approach Earth is going to be 3 miles wide. It's called 3122 Florence. If this giant hit our planet, it could wipe entire continents off the face of the Earth. In 2017, this space rock got awfully close to us. It could be seen in the sky even with a small telescope. Now, the next asteroid is the biggest one to worry about. 1999 JM8. It's about as wide as Manhattan. And it has an unnerving habit of approaching Earth a bit too close for everyone's liking. A small asteroid named 2020 VT4 got closer to our planet than all others have ever done. In November 2020, it flew over the Pacific Ocean at an altitude a bit smaller than the distance from Los Angeles to Las Vegas. That space rock was about the size of a big car. If it did make it to Earth's atmosphere, it would burn up completely before touching the ground. Falling asteroids and meteorites aren't uncommon on our planet. Luckily, most of them burst into flames and burn up before they enter the atmosphere. Mars is to blame for such frequent meteor showers. The planet isn't far from the main asteroid belt in the solar system. Sometimes, the gravitational pull of the red planet grabs asteroids from there. Then, Mars spins them around and flings them in our direction, just like a slingshot. So, Mars is a bully. (laughs) Good thing we're protected by Jupiter. It's the largest planet in our solar system, and it has an incredibly strong gravitational field. It keeps the asteroid belt in line and protects us from being constantly hit by a rain of meteorites. And that's good news, considering Ceres is in the asteroid belt. This enormous space rock is so big that it was once considered to be a planet. Then, for many years, scientists called Ceres an asteroid. But in 2006, it was finally classified as a dwarf planet. This space object contains a third of the total mass of the asteroid belt, which is about 4% of the Moon's mass. If Earth were as large as a nickel, Ceres would be about the size of a poppy seed. So, what if an asteroid several miles across was heading toward our planet and people had to stop it? Well, we could break the space rock into smaller pieces. A massive explosion could be used to do this. People wouldn't even need to land on the giant asteroid. Getting close to its surface would be enough. Boom! A powerful burst of energy would split the asteroid into several large pieces and tons of debris. The smallest rocks would burn in the heat released in the blast and it would also change the asteroid's trajectory. The larger fragments would burn up while entering the atmosphere. 
All witnesses of this unusual meteor shower would have a chance to admire a beautiful fire show. Another means of protection could be a kinetic battering ram. Simply put, it would be a huge object that people would send towards the asteroid approaching Earth. Or it could be a heavy spaceship. This is the method scientists produce to prevent the asteroid Apophis from falling to Earth. This guy is 1,200 feet across and often passes by our planet, coming as close as 19,000 miles above Earth's surface. The asteroid is going to pass close to our planet again in 2029. And there is a possibility that in 3036, it might crash into the Earth. If it happened, the explosion would leave a crater more than 3 miles across. Within 6 miles of the impact zone, all buildings and subway tunnels would be crushed or severely damaged. The event would also trigger a powerful earthquake. In the area of 30 miles away from the crater, car windows and window panes in houses would be shattered. And 75 miles away from the impact site, the earthquake would move furniture and buildings. One way to stop such a catastrophe is to build a heavy spaceship. It would take off from Earth, speed up, and then ram into the asteroid with great force. This impact would alter the course of the huge space rock, and it would fly past our planet. We could also try to stop the asteroid by wrapping it in foil. This would make its surface reflective, and then solar pressure might gradually change the asteroid's trajectory. Another alternative is using the gravitational tug. In this case, we would send an unmanned spaceship, large and heavy, toward the asteroid. It would fly over the space rock and slowly draw the thing closer with its gravitational pull. A small change, of course, would be enough to make the asteroid fly past our planet. Another way to protect Earth would be to build a system of giant lenses in space. Perhaps you've tried focusing sunlight with eyeglass lenses. Then you know how hot this sunlight can get. Now imagine having many giant lenses that are all directed at one point. Scientists think that focusing such a powerful beam of light on the asteroid would make the rock melt and evaporate, slowly changing its route. And one more way to protect ourselves from the asteroid would be to install several rocket engines on its surface. It would turn the space object into a rocket, and we could set its course from Earth. Rogue stars pose a much bigger danger. Like asteroids, they fly through space and can collide with anything in their path. The problem is that they have a gigantic mass, sometimes comparable to our suns. Around 70,000 years ago, a duo of rogue stars whooshed past the sun. It didn't affect Earth, but caused some disturbance on the outskirts of the solar system. This event is likely to happen again, someday. The rogue star Gliese 710, about half the mass of our sun, is moving toward our solar system right now. There's a possibility that it'll begin to grab asteroids from the outer asteroid belt and toss them at us. And then, rare meteor showers you can observe these days will become a regular occurrence. But right now, this rogue star is extremely far from our world. And there's a bigger chance that it'll pass by without affecting our peaceful existence. There are places on Earth where you can just look up at the sky, and it takes your breath away. An epic night sky full of stars and other stuff? Let's see if we can find one near where you live. The Natural Bridges National Monument in Utah would be a great place to start. The Rhön Biosphere Reserve in Germany is pretty good too. Then there's the Iriomote Ishigaki National Park in Japan. And there's always Cherry Springs State Park in Pennsylvania. Get this, the stars you see when you gaze up might not be there anymore. That's because some stars are so far away, their light takes years to reach us. Take Deneb, for example. Deneb's light took nearly 3,000 years to reach us. So the light we're seeing is actually 3,000 years old. Closer to home, flying around in space, asteroids. These clunky pieces of rock come in all shapes and sizes. Some aren't even made of rock, and some are the size of dwarf planets. That's huge! Take Ceres, a dwarf planet between Mars and Jupiter. It hangs out with its other asteroid buddies in the asteroid belt. Think of it like this. If planet Earth was the size of a nickel, Ceres would be the size of a tiny chia seed. 
Remember that huge space rock that supposedly wiped out the dinosaurs all those years ago? Of course not, you weren't even there. That was a full-out asteroid, not just a meteorite. Asteroids usually break up when they hit Earth's atmosphere, splitting up into a bunch of small meteorites. But this big boy was so dense and massive that it survived the journey all in one piece. What hit the dinosaurs was the real thing. That asteroid, the one that wiped out those poor dinosaurs, is thought to have been about eight miles wide, and it did all that damage. After an asteroid enters the Earth's atmosphere, it speeds up like crazy. That's why it was so powerful. If it had floated down with the help of a huge parachute, well, not much would have happened. And today, we might even have dinosaurs as pets. Or worse, they might be our overlords. Don't worry, most asteroids are pretty well behaved, sitting nicely in that huge ring between Mars and Jupiter, just like our dwarf planet buddy, Ceres. There are more than 200 massive asteroids in the ring. But asteroids come in all shapes and sizes, and we can't ignore the little ones. They need love too. And there are a lot of them. They're not even that little. Around a million of these baby asteroids are about half a mile long, and millions more are even smaller. There are cases of asteroids coming pretty close to Earth, and that's definitely something we want to avoid. They might be interesting and fun to watch, but they could cause serious problems if they crashed into us. So, what could we do? Basically, just observe and report. Scientists track any asteroids near Earth and try to predict their journey through our solar system. The ones that get really close are called near-Earth objects, or NEOs. The largest asteroid to have approached Earth was estimated to be about four miles wide. That's about 70 football fields. That's quite a lot of football. About once a year, an asteroid the size of a car hits the Earth's atmosphere. Our atmosphere is pretty good at breaking these guys up. So all you see is a small fireball streaking across the sky. Woohoo! Free fireworks! September 2017. That's the last time a really big asteroid got close to Earth. The next one? NASA says it won't be until around 2057. How about smaller ones? They come along every couple of years, and they're only about three to six feet wide. The smallest one ever came in 2008, and it was only about a couple feet long. I mean, you can probably stretch your legs that long. What about the ones that have actually hit Earth? Some of them made quite a big impact, leaving a crater where they crash landed. The single largest known impact zone of an asteroid is the Vredefort Crater, and it's huge. It's about 180 miles across. That's the distance from New York to Boston. It's in South Africa, and it's about 2 million years old. So what would happen if an asteroid was on a collision course with Earth? What would we do? Lasers. If we were to point powerful lasers at the asteroid for long enough, we might be able to change its course. We could also use a gravity tractor. This theory involves using a spacecraft to orbit around the asteroid, slowly pulling it off course. These are all pretty sci-fi though. The one method that we'd probably end up using is to just throw spacecrafts at the asteroid. Hopefully, it would either change course or split up into smaller, less dangerous bits. But say one does hit Earth. What would be worse, it hitting a city or hitting the ocean? Hitting a city would be pretty devastating, but there would probably be plenty of time to evacuate. You'd have time to fly or drive to another city, though it might be hard to find a hotel room. Still, buildings and landmarks would be gone. No more parks, streets, or houses. If an asteroid hit a city, first off, it would feel like a massive earthquake. People in cities far away would probably feel the impact. Then, fires would start breaking out everywhere. That's because of all the factories, gas stations, power lines, flammable stuff everywhere. Buildings, cars, trees, a lot of things would be on fire. The asteroid would also leave its mark there'd be a huge crater right in the middle of the city. In the 1700s, Lisbon in Portugal was struck by an earthquake and a tsunami just after that. No big surprise, Lisbon was totally destroyed. It took ages for them to completely rebuild the city, but after the makeover, the city was better than ever. 
It had wider streets, more businesses, and the city got a brand new image. After that earthquake, Lisbon rose up again and was better than ever. So if an asteroid ever hit a modern city, we could definitely learn from its example and build a better one. Imagine this, a futuristic and eco-friendly city. A city with lots of green spaces, bike lanes wide enough for everyone, skyscrapers that disappear out of sight, roads so perfect there wouldn't be any traffic, sidewalks that would actually be fun to walk on, a place for businesses to thrive and jobs for everyone, a city powered only by renewable energy, and loads of good vibes from its citizens. We might even have crazy new things we'd never seen before. How about getting to work or school on a zip line? Or a huge underground mall that goes on for miles and miles? Or how about see-through bridges and tunnels? <laughs> that would be awesome! Maybe I could finally get everything delivered to me by drone. Or somehow never have to take the trash out ever again. Worst case scenario? It could be turned into a sanctuary for wildlife. Let nature run its course and have wild animals live there, free and happy. In just a few years, the whole place would be green and full of life. Animals do pretty well once all us humans move out. If it hit the ocean, though, unless it was near the shore, the damage would be minimal. The water would absorb most of the energy from the impact. It's like throwing a rock into a pond. Sure, it causes a few ripples, but even they disappear after a while. The big danger would be if it triggered a tsunami, like in Lisbon. We could also mine the asteroid. It might be full of precious metals, like gold, silver, platinum, or other metals we've never even seen before. Scientists have been trying to find a way to mine asteroids in space and bring the metals back home. That kind of project would be ridiculously expensive though, so not worth it. But if an asteroid decided to knock on our front door, we'd be more than happy to mine it. For now, let's just hope they stay up there in space. Imagine sitting at home, drinking coffee, and watching a new episode of your favorite series, and suddenly, boom, crash, what's happened? Nothing terrible, just a meteorite that has just crashed into your kitchen after breaking the roof. You might think this story is entirely made up, but that's what actually happened in New Jersey during the Ida Aquarid meteor shower, which is active from April 19th to May 28th and peaking on May 5th through 6th. The space rock itself was the size of a pork roll sandwich. It was also pitch black and weighed almost four pounds. It slammed through the roof and hit the wooden floor, ruining it. When the inhabitants of the house found the rock and touched it, it was still warm. Luckily, the thing wasn't radioactive and there was no one at home at the time this intruder arrived. But the most shocking thing about this meteorite? Astronomers believe it might have come from a cosmic snowball traveling far, far away from Earth. To explain this, I'll have to tell you a bit more about the Eta Aquarid. This meteor shower is famous for its fast meteors, leaving long, glowing trails. It's produced by Comet Halley, completing its orbit around the Sun every 76 years. The comet hasn't visited Earth since 1986 and won't come back until 2061. Right now, it's somewhere near the constellation of Hydra, which is more than 100 light years away from our planet. Every year, Earth has to pass through trails of debris left by the comet. They collide with our atmosphere, disintegrate, and create beautiful, colorful streaks in the night sky. And it happens every time Halley returns to the inner solar system. Its nucleus sheds a layer of ice and rock into space, and some of it reaches our planet. The central New Jersey authorities believe the meteorite that sneaked into the house originated from that meteor shower. But I feel that you might be pondering another question that confuses many people. What's the difference between all those space bodies? I mean, there are so many of them flying out there. Meteors, meteorites, asteroids, comets. Ugh. Okay, let's figure it out together. An asteroid is a rocky body orbiting the sun. It's usually not very big and quite inactive. Comets are different. They're covered with ice that normally evaporates in sunlight, forming a coma, which is what a comet's atmosphere is called. This coma consists of dust and gas. A comet also has a tail that is made of dust and or gas too. A meteoroid is a small part of a comet or asteroid that orbits the sun. If this meteoroid manages to sneak into Earth's atmosphere and vaporize there, it's a meteor. It's often called a shooting star. 
And finally, if a meteoroid manages to survive the passage through our planet's atmosphere and lands on Earth's surface, it becomes a meteorite. If you think such space guests are a rare occurrence, that's not exactly true. Every day our planet is hit with more than 100 tons of sand-sized particles. About once a year, a large, car-sized asteroid enters Earth's atmosphere, turns into an impressive fireball and burns, luckily, before reaching the surface of the planet. And every 2,000 years or so, a meteoroid the size of a soccer field hits Earth, causing a lot of damage. And now, imagine this. A huge, really ginormous asteroid is approaching our planet. There's no one on Earth to predict its appearance. Neither is there anyone to stop it. That's why soon, the asteroid crashes into the surface of Earth. The force of the collision is so powerful that the space visitor doesn't stop until it gets through the crust to a depth of several miles. The impact leaves a crater of more than 100 miles across. Thousands of cubic miles of solid rock instantly turn into vapor. The crash sets off a series of natural disasters that erase 75% of life on Earth. The creatures that were close enough to see the crash don't survive for longer than a few seconds. Even closer to the impact crater, the ground is covered with thousands of feet of hot ash, grit, and rubble. Several seconds later, everything for many miles around bursts into flames. What doesn't burn down within the next several minutes after the collision faces a different, even more terrifying fate. The asteroid causes a monstrous, largest ever tsunami. A recent study claims that it was thousands of times more powerful than any wave people have ever seen. The tsunami was so devastating, it eroded seafloor sediments half a world away. The team of scientists even remodeled the events of the first 10 minutes after the impact, and the model showed that the asteroid had produced waves up to 30,000 times greater than one of the largest tsunamis people have ever recorded, the one in the Indian Ocean in 2004. You've probably already guessed that I'm talking about a real-life event, namely the asteroid collision that wiped dinosaurs off the face of the Earth. The Chicxulub asteroid, as we now know it, is believed to come from the outer reaches of the solar system. This space body was at least six miles across. It crashed into the shallow seawaters near the Yucatan Peninsula. The impact was so powerful that it left its signature on the face of the planet. In 2021, researchers found out that the collision had carved mega ripples into Earth's crust in the region of modern-day central Louisiana. But such devastating events, when an object that large threatens Earth's inhabitants, happen very rarely once every few million years. Space rocks smaller than 80 feet usually burn up in the atmosphere of our planet, causing little to no damage. If a rocky meteoroid larger than 80 feet but smaller than half a mile across was to hit Earth, it would cause local damage to the impact area. As for a space rock with a diameter larger than half a mile, it'd likely have worldwide effects. And these space bodies aren't even the largest. For comparison, asteroids populating the main asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter can be as huge as 580 miles across. But you can breathe out. They're too far away and don't pose any threat to our planet. All the time, our scientists keep learning more and more about hazardous asteroids and comets. They have even established a Planetary Defense Coordination Office, aka PDCO. It ensures that potentially hazardous objects get detected as early as possible. An object is considered potentially hazardous if its orbit is predicted to bring it within 5 million miles of Earth. It should also be large enough to reach the surface of our planet over 100 feet across. Interestingly, a meteorite impact isn't the worst thing you need to worry about. Some scientists warn that the most dangerous thing is the shock wave produced by a meteor breaking apart in the atmosphere. For example, one meteor, which originally was an asteroid the size of a six-story building, entered our planet's atmosphere in February 2013 and broke apart 15 miles above the ground. This generated a shockwave that was equivalent to a ginormous explosion. An even larger space visitor was called the Tunguska meteorite. It was also 10 times more energetic. It broke into pieces over the Tunguska River in June 1908, flattening 500,000 acres of forest. If the meteorite hadn't been so huge, this event would have gone undetected because of the remote location where it all happened. So it's a good thing that 90 to 95% of meteors don't survive the fall through our planet's atmosphere. Only those that are made of stronger materials make it so far. Most meteorites, though, are thought to come from comets, which are way more fragile than asteroids. We should also consider the speed of a meteor. If one is approaching Earth at a slower speed, 
it's more likely to survive the collision with the atmosphere of our planet. It means that the meteor won't burn completely, and some of its remains will reach the ground. About 8 billion inhabitants of planet Earth found out the same terrible news in one day. Someone saw it on TV. Others heard it on the phone while scrolling through social media or listening to music. Some witnessed this news in a dream while sleeping. Someone's voice said it in all languages to ensure everyone understood it. I have good news and bad news for you. Let's start with the bad news. You're all characters in YouTube videos in which your planet gets into a situation where the moon breaks in half. For the audience, it will be a hypothetical story, but for you, these events will become a reality. The good news is that I was joking. There is no good news. But don't worry, the apocalypse won't start on your planet. Maybe just a little bit. Have a nice day. At first, the entire population panics. Then, a few days later, everyone calms down. Maybe it was a mass hallucination, and the moon will be all right. But at this moment, scientists have discovered the danger. A colossal meteorite is flying towards us from the distant depths of space. This meteorite is super fast and pretty flat, but has sharp edges. Fortunately, it will miss the Earth by a few thousand miles, but the moon won't be that lucky. The meteorite flies through our Earth's only natural satellite directly in the middle. So it passes through the moon, sweeps past our planet, and flies away into distant space. At this moment, all people can't take their eyes off the moon. The meteorite cuts it perfectly in half, gently, clearly, painlessly. So what shall we do now? Will the Earth survive this? Our satellite breaks into two equal parts, but fortunately, they don't fly away from each other. The moon's great gravity attracts them back like a magnet. Scientists are sure that the parts will connect in a couple of billion years, and the moon will become the same as it used to be. But the coolest thing is that people won't feel any changes. Everyone around the world will celebrate this good news. The voice was wrong. But then another problem appears. A massive meteorite in the form of a shoe is flying from the deepest space to us. It enters our solar system and approaches the Earth at high speed. The space boot crashes into one half of the moon and then flies away. Now, the moon is definitely breaking into two parts. The first half remains in the same place. The second one is flying towards us. A small meteor shower begins on Earth because of the falling moon fragments, but it's not so bad. Most of these rocks are burning up in the atmosphere. But almost the entire split-off half is falling apart around the orbit of our planet. It forms a stone belt. Now the Earth is like Saturn. Rotating fragments destroy part of our artificial satellites. Communication and the internet work inconsistently. It takes people a couple of years to restore a stable connection. The International Space Station no longer exists. Luckily, all the astronauts managed to return to Earth before half the moon got to them. So, moon rocks are flying around the planet, and people see half the moon in the sky. Life doesn't change much for the first few days, but those who live on the coast of the seas and oceans notice the consequences. The moon used to influence the tides. It was flying around the Earth and made oceans take an oval shape. There were tides on the side where the moon was closer. There were ebbs on the opposite side. But now, this schedule is wrong. Half of the moon attracts less water. Yes, the moon lost half its weight and began approaching the Earth. But its gravitational force has become weaker. Seabirds, many species of fish, sea turtles, and other coastal animals may not survive these changes. Their natural instincts associated with the moon help them determine the time for getting food, breeding, and flying south. For example, tiny turtles expect a strong tide in the morning. They run to the water, but the water doesn't reach them. Turtles can't hide in the ocean in time and become dinner for seagulls. Crabs can't lay eggs because the tide has started earlier than usual. Wolves go mad in the woods. They howl loudly every night and can't stop. The whole natural world can't understand what's going on. The human body is also feeling some discomfort. Many people have low and high blood pressure, and some experience severe headaches. Half of the moon changes the entire ecosystem of the planet. Adapting to new conditions will take several tens, maybe hundreds of years. A couple of weeks pass, and people notice the days are now shorter. 
the moon always slowed the Earth's rotation and made one day last 24 hours. The Earth is spinning faster now. The night and the morning come earlier than everyone is used to. Earth rotation speed has increased and reduced the number of hours per day to 15. People suffer from insomnia or oversleeping. The body needs time to get used to it. Work schedules are changing all over the world. Previously, people came to the office at 9 and left at 6. Now, they arrive at 7 and leave at 2 p.m. Sleep time got shorter and people are really sad because of this. Progress slows down because the short working time. The technologies of the future are now 20 to 30 years late. Hourly pay remains the same, so bosses now pay less for fewer working hours. The whole moon stabilized the weather and climate on the planet. Look at Mars, it has two small moons. They quickly spin around it and rock Mars around on its axis. As a result, strong winds, sandstorms, and thunderstorms often happen on the red planet. Now the half of the moon that approached us takes the Earth out of stable rotation. This changes the seasonal temperatures in the world. It even gets hotter in hot places. And snowstorms are raging in cold regions. There are short, massive downpours instead of sunny weather. A typical breeze can grow into a hurricane and small waves into a tsunami. The seasons are changing faster now. Winters are colder and summers are hotter. Changing the rotation of the planet affects the Earth's magnetic field. Since the compass and navigation systems are unstable now, we need to recalculate where the north and south are. Birds can't fly south to wait out the winter since they don't know what direction to fly. Their inner compass is broken. Several hundred years have passed. People are entirely accustomed to the new conditions on Earth. New species of animals and fish have appeared. Birds can navigate the sky by the moon again. The planet's economy has been restored. Hourly wages have become higher. People now get enough sleep from five to six hours a day and work for four to five hours. The reduction of day and night has also affected the entertainment industry. Movies now last one hour. One episode of some TV series lasts 30 minutes. Life goes faster. An average person now lives to be 96 years old. In fact, the passage of time hasn't changed at all. Its calculus did. Several thousand years have passed. People look different now. Now they have big eyes that absorb more light. Half of the moon doesn't shine as bright as the whole thing, so the nights have become darker. It took the human eye a couple of thousand years to develop the ability to see clearly in this new dark. Animals need to navigate better in these conditions, so their eyes have become larger and more sensitive. During all this time, people have cleared the orbit of moon rocks. Several space stations fly around our planet. And again, people hear this strange voice that once told them that they were all characters in one hypothetical YouTube video. This time, the voice says, your story ends because the video ends. I'm sorry. Good night. It was a quiet and clear night in the countryside as a lady slept peacefully with her dog calmly at the end of her bed, when suddenly a loud crash woke her. Something fell through the ceiling. The dog began barking at the sudden loud noise of the unknown intruder. As the lady gathered her senses and wiped her face, she turned on the light. She looked around her room, trying to find the cause of the noise. She was shocked and confused to see a great hole in the ceiling. And directly below, right next to where her head was just lying, she saw a rock the size of her fist. Shaken, she immediately called the responsible person as she thought, but he advised that the rock was likely from a nearby construction site. This added further confusion as she was in the middle of nowhere. Nothing could have caused this to her knowledge. The next day, the responsible people visited to investigate. Further, the more detailed analysis showed that it wasn't just any rock, but a meteorite. Did you know that the chances of getting under a meteorite are about 1 in 250,000? It seems like relatively good odds. However, just for comparison, the odds of meeting a shark is 1 in 3.5 million. Do you often fly by plane? Perhaps you fancy your chances with the weather. Being caught in a tornado is a possibility of 1 in 13 million. 
And if you are a bit of a risk taker, the chances of you winning the big lottery is 1 in 292 million. So, given the odds, it would appear that a meteor fall would be a pretty common occurrence. Yet there are very few known instances of anyone getting by one. The Canadian woman who received the unexpected guest was lucky that it was a small stone. In 2013, an asteroid entered the Earth's atmosphere to the territory of the city of Russia with a population of 1 million people. Little did a cab driver realize, as he drove his cab, that an asteroid entering Earth's atmosphere was the most prominent object from space to enter Earth's atmosphere in over 100 years, measuring 66 feet wide. Everybody knows asteroids are gigantic objects revolving around our Sun that aren't planets or moons. They're made from rocks and dust and come in all kinds of weird shapes. The largest is at about 329 miles in diameter. Asteroids mostly live within the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. You can imagine what a journey it made to the Earth on that day. Given that the asteroid belt is so extensive and populated with all sorts of debris, collisions between objects are very likely. As the objects collide with one another, their trajectory changes, leading them outside of the asteroid belt. And on that day, it launched them in the direction of our planet. The city taxi driver dropped off his fare as the asteroid entered the atmosphere. The man saw many people on the street pointing to the sky. He got out of his cab and looked in the same direction. He saw a long tail of smoke across the sky with a bright object at the head of it, hurtling towards Earth at an unimaginable speed. As the atmospheric pressure slowed and heated the asteroid, causing it to glow brighter, it sped towards Earth. The man, unable to turn away, stood mesmerized. He watched on as the asteroid became brighter and brighter until it became brighter than the sun for a moment. The man turned his head away and covered with his arms to block the flash, as it was too blinding to look directly towards it. But as the asteroid reached its peak luminosity, it broke apart into several pieces that then continued falling towards the ground. Startled, the man looked around. The people on the street were also standing silent and unsure of what had just transpired. Suddenly, they heard multiple loud bangs in the near distance. The Earth shook as the falling pieces of the asteroid hit the Earth. Windows within buildings surrounding the street shattered. Cars parked had their alarms activated by the vibrations. Some people ran, but others in the street stood frozen, looking around at one another, still trying to make sense of what had just happened. The ground affected was extensive, covering up to 60 miles wide. Windows were shattered throughout the town. As the dust settled and repairs were made, scientists analyzed the pieces of the asteroid to identify where it had come from. They found that a collision within the asteroid belt had indeed caused it, and this 66-foot intruder was only a tiny piece of an even more giant asteroid. Given the crowded location when the asteroid fell, it was a miracle that no one was physically hit. There has only been one case where a meteorite had made physical contact with a person. It happened in 1954 in the USA. A lady was relaxing on her sofa, enjoying a short nap, when suddenly she was woken by a jolt in the side of her belly. The asteroid had been noticed by many in the same area. Reports were recorded that it had been the size of a basketball as it fell towards Earth. But after it burned up in the atmosphere and crashed through the woman's house, it had shrunk significantly by the time it made contact with her. After it was confirmed it was an intruder from space, the American lady then became the first and only recorded person on Earth hit by a meteorite. Within the asteroid belt, the asteroids also share their home with comets. Comets share the same ranges in size as the asteroids, but they're mainly made of ice. They can also have bits of rock and dust within their body. Comets have a long tail following behind them, which is made from their interaction with the Sun. Comets aren't only located within the asteroid belt. They're well known to have all kinds of paths, not only restricted to just within our solar system. Some sightings of these periodic comets are documented in human history, appearing on infrequent occasions as they make their long journey throughout the solar system. Most notably is Halley's Comet, which can be visible on Earth on average once every 76 years. The last one was about 36 years ago. 
The first known record by humans of Halley's Comet was as far as 240 BCE. Halley's Comet is next expected to say hello in about 40 years from now, so make sure you get your telescopes ready. Asteroids and comets are big and scary for sure, and we all know that the dinosaurs were not able to detect the asteroid that impacted the Earth which ended their reign on this planet. But luckily for us humans, we have scientists carefully observing our solar system. Asteroids and comets are so large that they can be easily detected, so there's nothing to be concerned about soon. Now that we have the concerning space rocks out of the way, let's move on to their smaller relatives, the smallest being meteors, made from rock and dust that are so small that they burn up within our atmosphere, having no impact other than a light show. Meteor showers provide the most exciting display for all your novice astronomers out there. Meteor showers are very common, occurring around 30 times per year. They're easily predicted when to occur. You'll just need to ensure you're outside of the city on a clear night and be sure to bring a blanket along with you. But why do we get meteor showers, and why are they so easily predicted? Well, it all relates to how the comet gets its tail. When the heat from the sun interacts with the comet and separates gases and pieces of the comet, the Earth then orbits into the path of that same debris which creates the magnificent display of the meteor shower. Being that meteors are too small to reach the ground of the Earth and burn up in our atmosphere, what if they could reach Earth? Well, they would then be called meteorites, made up of the same ingredients as meteors, but ultimately, we would only find solid rock if we happened to come across them. What's interesting about meteorites is that they are pieces of an ancient puzzle that have been flying around space for millions to billions of years. They could even been flying aimlessly in space longer than our sun has been burning brightly in our sky. Our solar system will continue to provide more surprises for us to learn from, just like the asteroid that arrived in Russia in 2013, which scientists only overlooked due to another asteroid that was being monitored closely on the very same day. But as we continue to have these experiences, we will continue to learn from them. And hopefully, when the next big one flies by, we'll be ready. Meteorites rain down on Earth every single year. Almost 63% of the 69,268 meteorites scientists have officially recorded in the Meteoritical Bulletin database have been picked up from a polar desert. From where? Antarctica. It's technically a desert because it gets little precipitation. The continent receives an average equivalent of about 6 inches of water annually, mostly from snow. The interior parts are even drier. Not much action happens to meteorites there. Deserts are like safe storage closets for them, and it's easier to spot meteorites there. In total, there are around 42,000 meteorites in Antarctica. Most of them have been spotted since 1976. The Sahara Desert in Africa isn't far behind. Nomads and treasure hunters have discovered over 14,000 meteorites there, especially since 1995. Then there's the Arabian Peninsula, mainly Oman, where they've unearthed about 4,200 meteorites. So why does Antarctica take the crown for its meteorite collection compared to other areas? It's not because more meteorites land there. Statistically, they can land anywhere. Antarctica wins because it's great at showing off these space rocks. The icy environment keeps them in mint condition. The contrast between the ice and space rocks makes spotting meteorites easy. Plus, there are spots called meteorite stranding zones, where the geology, ice flow, and climate team up to gather meteorites. Here's the sci-fi part. Satellites help researchers find meteorites. They use these space gadgets to spot the best places to search. Some of these meteorites are ancient, like a million years old. Now, when you think about how many meteorites there are, it's a bit like a pie chart. If you measure their weight, instead of just counting them, things get interesting. Antarctica's slice of the pie gets smaller. On average, an Antarctic meteorite weighs about 2 ounces, like a small bar of chocolate. Ooh, chocolate. But in the Sahara, They've got all sizes, so the average is about a pound. Now, let's talk about meteorites in action. Only a tiny bit, maybe just 1.8% of all meteorites found have been seen falling. 
These are called falls. Clever name. Meteorite detectives or meteoriticists get all excited when they see that. The other 98% are finds. Someone stumbled upon them without seeing the meteorite take its cosmic leap. So when we only look at the ones that fell from the sky, most are called stony meteorites. These are like regular fellas of the meteorite world, but there's also a special kind called iron meteorites, or just irons. There are also super rare meteorites, called mesositerites and pelocities, that are like a mix of metal and regular rock stuff. In places where humans live, like North America, people tend to find more iron meteorites than those that fell. That's because iron ones are usually bigger and more eye-catching. Farmers found some of these while they were working in their fields. Oh, surprise! A bunch of gigantic iron meteorites from places like China, Namibia, and the US make the chart slices huge. Now, check out this adventure. A group of scientists braving the crazy cold of Antarctica's icy desert to uncover some fresh meteorites found what they had been looking for. In fact, one of the meteorites weighed almost 17 pounds. The ones like that are pretty huge. Do they have an impact on Earth? Science says yes, they do. Meteorite impacts are more common than you think. About 17 meteorites smack Earth's surface every single day. Since most of the planet is covered with water, there are loads of places without people around. That's why these hits often go unnoticed. Most meteorites are just small bits zipping through our atmosphere anyway. By the time they touch down, they get tiny thanks to all the friction against the air. Not all meteorite impacts are wimpy. Some supersized ones have rocked our world. Remember when dinosaurs said bye-bye? Yeah, that might have been the fault of a huge asteroid. These meteorite hits are random, and they happen all the time. Scientists have uncovered evidence of a massive meteor impact even before the famous dinosaur wipeout. This impact is thought to have triggered the biggest extinction event in Earth's history. The 300-mile-wide impact crater is chilling over a mile beneath the East Antarctic ice sheet. This mega-event occurred about 250 million years ago. The epicenter of the crater is in the Wilkesland area of East Antarctica. It might have started the breakup of the Gondwana supercontinent. It was a big landmass that included parts of what are now South America, Africa, Antarctica, Australia, and more. So, the Gondwanda supercontinent started to chip off by creating a tectonic rift that pushed Australia northward. This Wilkesland impact surpasses the one that led to the dinosaurs' extinction in terms of scale and could have caused catastrophic consequences at the time. The Hoba meteorite is a huge chunk of space stuff chilling on Earth. It crash-landed about 80,000 years ago in Namibia. The thing is a heavyweight, like twice the size of the next biggest meteorite ever found. Interestingly, it also has a weird flat shape. Nobody's moved it since it fell, so we really don't know how deep it's hidden. But experts think it's skidded along ground like a stone skipping on a lake because it landed at an angle. That's why it didn't leave a big crater when it hit the ground. And it was discovered by chance. A farmer found the world's biggest single meteorite. He was plowing his field with an ox and a regular plow. Suddenly, he heard a scraping noise. It was the metal plow meeting the iron meteorite. The Mosey meteorite from Tanzania has been staying underground for centuries before scientists gave it a proper look. The locals loved this space gem, calling it Commando. It was known in town for generations. Mosey is made of the same stuff as its other meteorite friends on Earth – about 90% iron and 8% nickel. It weighs 25 tons. Let's talk about the El Chaco meteorite, part of the Campo del Cielo meteorite crew in Argentina. Imagine an almost 24-square-mile playground for space rocks. El Chaco, weighing 37 tons, decided to show up fashionably late in 1969. So what if you found a meteorite? How can you tell for sure that it's not just some random rock? These space visitors have a few features that make them stand out from regular rocks. Firstly, meteorites are often heavier than they look because they're packed with heavy metals and dense materials. 
Secondly, most meteorites have some metallic iron, so magnets usually stick to them. If you've got a rock that's not magnetic, try suspending the magnet from a string. The third clue lies in their unusual shapes. Iron-nickel meteorites aren't smooth and round. Stony meteorites usually have a thin, crispy crust on the outside. It looks as if their surface melted a bit while moving through the atmosphere. Sounds like pizza to me. Suppose these tips won't help on your quest. Then consider this. Light-colored crystals are not meteorites. Those pretty things, like quartz, are common on Earth. But they don't hang out on other planets or moons in our solar system. Do you know those bubbly holes in volcanic rocks or melted metal slag on Earth? Meteorites don't have those either. Plus, scratching a meteorite shouldn't leave a mark. But if you scratch a dense rock and get a dark or red mark, the rock contains minerals like magnetite or hematite, which meteorites don't usually have. If you suspect finding a meteor in your backyard or something, try these tips. Just remember to be sure you've got to give rocks and minerals a real-life look from experts. And if you see one falling towards you, always remember to duck. Imagine wildfires raging across the continent, tsunamis crashing against coastlines, and almost 75% of species on our planet going extinct. That's what happened when the most devastating asteroid we know about hit our planet. Yes, I'm talking about the one that wiped dinos off the face of the Earth. But I've got some shocking news in store. This asteroid might have had a companion. Scientists discovered something that might be an impact crater 250 miles off the coast of West Africa. They were looking at the data from the seismic waves that the researchers had sent underground. Their goal was to check the ocean floor's terrain by observing the waves ripple through Earth. That's when they spotted a large bowl-shaped structure with a broken-up floor and a central peak. These features are very common for an impact crater. But the most unexpected thing was that the timing of this potential asteroid strike, which seemed to occur around 60 million years ago, could make it a sibling of the dinosaur-ending Chicxulub asteroid. This second asteroid might have broken off the main one, or they could have been part of a closely timed impact crater. You, along with many other people, might have questioned yourself, how come just one asteroid could have caused so much destruction that we don't see dinosaurs roaming the planet anymore? Well, that second asteroid might have helped. Researchers dubbed the crater it supposedly left the Nadir Crater. The name comes from the nearby underwater volcano. The discovery itself happened in 2020. It hasn't been confirmed yet that the crater was caused by an asteroid. But its features, including its scale, the height of the crater rim, and the ratio of height to width, most likely mean an impact origin. Plus, the deposits surrounding the Nadir crater look like something ejected from a crater after a collision. Scientists created some computer models and figured out that to cause such an impact, an asteroid had to be around a quarter of a mile across. Even though the Chicxulub itself was way larger, around six miles in diameter, the second hit would have been pretty impressive as well. The energy released at the moment of the collisions would have been more than 1,000 times greater than the eruption and tsunami in Tonga in January 2022. The hit would have also produced shockwaves equivalent to a magnitude 6.5 to 7 earthquake. It would have triggered underwater landslides, as well as a series of tsunamis. In any case, discoveries of such terrestrial impact craters are always a big deal. They're quite rare. Researchers have found fewer than 200 confirmed impact craters on Earth. Almost all of them have been discovered on land. There are also several likely candidates, but their origin hasn't been confirmed yet. What can the newly found crater be if it wasn't left by an asteroid? It could be a collapsed volcanic caldera, or it could be a salt diapir, which is a squeezed body of salt. To confirm that the Nadir crater was created by an asteroid strike, scientists need to drill into the formation and gather samples. 
The evidence scientists are looking for might be shocked quartz, a mineral that appears when asteroids crash into our planet. If we do find it, we'll hopefully learn whether this discovery has any connection to the Chicxulub. Its fall led to terrifying consequences on Earth. The asteroid is believed to have come from the outer reaches of the solar system. When it crashed into the planet, the force of the collision was so powerful that the space rock didn't stop until it got through Earth's crust to a depth of several miles. The impact left a crater more than 100 miles across. Thousands of cubic miles of solid rock instantly turned into vapor. The crash set off a series of natural disasters that erased around 75% of plant and animal species on Earth. Animals that were close enough to see the crash didn't survive for longer than a few seconds. Close to the impact crater, the ground was covered with thousands of feet of hot ash, grit, and rubble. Several seconds after the collision, everything, for many miles around, burst into flames. What didn't burn down within the next several minutes faced a different, even more terrifying problem. The asteroid also produced a monstrous largest ever tsunami. A recent study claims that it was thousands of times larger than any wave people have ever seen. You see, the splashdown was so powerful that it left its signature on the face of our planet. In 2021, researchers found out that the collision had carved mega ripples into the Earth's crust in the region of modern-day central Louisiana. An even newer study suggests that the asteroid also triggered a tsunami so devastating it eroded seafloor sediments half a world away. The team of scientists even remodeled the events of the first 10 minutes after the impact. And the model showed that the asteroid had produced waves up to 30,000 times greater than one of the largest tsunamis people have ever recorded. The Indian Ocean tsunami that hit Indonesia in 2004. The collision displaced so much water that it created a wave almost a mile high. And, of course, all that empty place didn't stay empty for long. The ocean gushed back to fill the crater, but in the process, it only ricocheted off the crater's rim, which produced even more waves. After that, tsunami waves that were more than 33 feet tall traveled around the world at a speed of 3 feet per second, lashing at all coastlines on their way. No wonder the largest and fastest moving waves occurred near the impact area in the open waters of the Gulf of Mexico. Those rose more than 330 feet tall and moved at a speed 10 times greater than more distant tsunami waves. During the first hours after the crash, the sky was almost totally dark. Later, it started to get lighter, but very, very slowly. For the next couple of years, the world seemed to be stuck between a cloudy day and twilight. Lots of plants didn't survive this dimness and the absence of sunlight. The ash stayed in the air for months. That's why when it rained, the water became highly acidic. Fires kept raging. They produced tons of toxic gases that destroyed the ozone layer, at least for some time. The gases and particles that had been flung into the atmosphere blotted the sun out. This caused temperatures to plummet by over 60 degrees Fahrenheit. Lots of plant and animal species that managed to survive the impact itself couldn't stand these new hostile conditions. By the way, the infamous asteroid could have also been part of a shout, since there's some evidence that many other space rocks smashed into the moon at approximately the same time. In December 2020, some glass was found on the moon. It could have been forming there over billions of years as the soil was ejected during asteroid impacts. The discovered glass was delivered to Earth by the Chinese National Space Agency's Chang'e 5 lunar mission. Researchers have concluded that the super tiny glass beads were indeed created by the heat and pressure of meteorite impacts. It means that their age should be the same as the time of the collision. Using the glass beads, scientists managed to create the timeline of such collisions. They think the timings of asteroids hitting the moon could mirror the impacts of asteroids hitting our planet. Even more exciting, scientists have found out that the age of some lunar glass beads coincides with the age of some of the largest impact craters on Earth, including the Chicxulub Impact Crater. 
If this theory about smaller impacts accompanying large impact events on our planet turns out to be true, we'll get important information about asteroid impacts on Earth and the inner solar system. Now, researchers are planning to compare the data received from the Chang'e 5 samples with other samples of the lunar soil from different craters. It may reveal new evidence about what impacts may have influenced life on Earth. The near future. Our planet is running out of energy sources, and the human population is growing. There's less free space on Earth every year. People have to move to other planets as soon as possible. But there isn't enough energy for spaceships and interstellar voyages. You're a member of a group of scientists searching for energy sources in the universe. Solar power, windmills, hydro and thermal power plants. It's not enough. You offer an adventurous but risky idea. You want to create an object and accelerate it to the speed of light. This object will start generating infinite energy. Other scientists immediately reject this idea. Such an experiment can destroy the entire planet and even the solar system. If something moves faster than light particles, it creates a black hole. To reduce the risks, you suggest speeding up a small and thin object, like a simple needle. As soon as it reaches the speed of light and releases energy, special machines similar to solar panels will absorb this energy. Only one millisecond of moving at the speed of light will be enough for humanity. Then the needle should be stopped. You suggest to slow it down with the help of Mount Everest. You want the needle to smash into it. As soon as you start working on the experiment, you face an unsolvable problem. An ordinary needle, like any other object with mass, can't reach the speed of light. According to the laws of physics, it's impossible. To do this, you need to turn the needle into a beam of photons. The metal of the needle will be erased into dust during acceleration to the speed of light. Earth's atmosphere shows strong resistance to a moving object. So now, you need to create the strongest durable material in the universe. It not only has to withstand the air resistance, but also not be torn apart by the energy growing in it. When any object increases its speed, its energy increases too. You need a lot of money to create such a needle. But before you get it, you have to conduct this experiment in a simulation program to prove you're doing the right thing. This program is a computer hologram of the solar system. The program imitates and visualizes all the laws of physics. You can run your experiment using this model, and if it goes well, you'll get money to implement your plan. So, you create a computer simulation of the needle. Then, you build a machine with an incredibly powerful engine. It works like a rocket. Several motors are attached to the needle. They help reach the speed of sound, then charge the needle with energy and release it. Using the charge force, the needle should accelerate to the speed of light and crash into Everest. You'd need to set the launch spot of the needle a long way from the mountain for the whole operation to work out. Air resistance greatly hinders the acceleration. The needle's path must pass through thousands of miles of free space. You decide that it's better to launch the experiment from space, where there's no resistance. To do this, you build a base on the moon in the simulation. Computers calculate the exact start time and needle position. You need to know the speed of the Earth's movement around its axis and the Moon's movement around our planet. The slightest deviation from the course can cause the needle to crash into the ocean or a city. If it gets into the water, severe floods and tsunamis will happen all around the world. The computer calculates the ideal moment for the needle to fly. You're ready to start the operation. Scientists and presidents of different countries are watching the simulation. You're so nervous, you're sweating. You come up to the computer and press the start button. Everyone is looking at the big screen. A rocket with a needle placed on top flies up. It's rising high above the moon. It reaches the speed of sound. The first engine falls off. The rocket's mass decreases and its speed increases. Half the distance between our planet and the moon is gone. There's two engine turbines left. The speed of sound is exceeded by 10 times. The second engine falls off. The needle is approaching the Earth's atmosphere. The third engine generates a huge charge of energy, strikes it into the needle, and flies away. The needle turns bright red and hot like the sun. It penetrates the Earth's atmosphere. The protective layers of our planet can't prevent the needle from reaching its goal. The sky lights up with a bright flash. In the next half second, the needle will hit Everest at the speed of light. Two seconds later, your experiment will fail. And here's why. 
the greater the speed of any object, the larger the mass and the amount of energy that accumulates inside. When the needle reaches the speed of light, its energy begins to increase indefinitely. The mass grows to infinity. And when this happens, a black hole is formed, a massive object with an incredible gravitational force that absorbs absolutely everything, even light particles, photons, and the time dimension. This is called the event horizon. Literally, everything that is an event, time, space, matter, is absorbed by the black hole. No one knows what is inside the black hole. After one millisecond, the needle almost reaches the speed of light. It releases a huge amount of energy into the atmosphere. If you look at it in slow motion, you can see how the air is ionized. That is, the air molecules are split. In nature, this process occurs during lightning flashes. Our sun also has ionizing energy and disinfects the air. The needle cuts through the Earth's atmosphere. The sky is lit up with a bright light. All the clouds and every water molecule around the needle instantly evaporate at the high temperature. The sky becomes crystal clear hundreds of miles around the spot. In the center of this clean circle is the needle, and it's approaching Mount Everest. Hundreds of thousands of tons of snow burn up as soon as the needle gets close to it. It has reached the speed of light. A thick layer of ground melts and flies away in different directions. It looks like someone has thrown a spear into an ice cream mountain. Everest can't handle so much energy and is torn apart into a million pieces like a sandcastle. The incredible power of the blast wave destroys everything around. Stone, wood, soil, leaves, concrete, everything falls apart into billions of pieces because of the powerful energy and heat. Then, all these molecules are erased. The needle moves faster than photons, and as soon as it overtakes the light, it starts to overtake time. From the needle's point of view, all events begin to go in reverse. The mass of the needle becomes infinite, and the greater the mass, the greater the energy. A burst of unthinkable gravitational force absorbs all space. Land, trees, nearby cities, the Earth's crust, and the core, everything disappears in a matter of seconds. A black hole absorbs light and time. An absolute black void has come. The black hole is growing. Holographic International Space Station is shrinking thanks to the strong pressure of gravity and is being pulled into a black void. Then, it's the moon's turn. The force of gravity increases quickly. The hole is getting heavier and more massive. All the planets of the solar system collapse as the gravitational black giant grows. The sunlight goes in and never comes back. The black hole becomes thousands of times heavier than the sun. Our star splits into millions of thin strips of light, like spaghetti, and spits out powerful streams of energy. An empty sector of outer space with an expanding black hole is in the place where our solar system was just moments ago. Meteorites flying past it also fall into the trap. Just one small needle managed to cause such a disaster. The simulation ends. The program breaks down because it can't calculate further events. You realize it was a bad idea after all. You decide you'll try to get the energy from the Earth's core instead. Here's a random thought. Try to imagine the animals that could become the new top species should humans go extinct, that is. <laughs> Tricky, right? I mean, we are pretty cool with our high intelligence, fashion sense, ability to cook, and smartphones. Even if we forget the password sometimes. But if we suddenly disappeared, what animals might evolve to develop our skills and build complex societies like we have? Or would they come up with something better? Scientists have some ideas, thanks to modern gene sequencing technology and our understanding of evolution. We know that the climate on the planet will continue to change, so many species will need to adapt to survive. Convergence, which is when two unrelated organisms end up developing similar traits to succeed in a particular environment or fill a niche, will also play a big role. For example, fish are perfected for life in water with their torpedo-like bodies and fins. But dolphins have evolved a very similar body, even though they're warm-blooded, air-breathing mammals with a completely different evolutionary background. So, maybe some animals could develop hands similar to ours to fill the same role as humans, like building cities and modifying the environment. 
primates like chimpanzees and bonobos are already close to that with their opposable thumbs, which they use to make tools in the wild. It's also possible that birds, the only surviving dinosaurs, could become the new smartest animals if humans suddenly disappear. Birds are incredibly brainy and can flock together in large groups. Some, such as sociable weavers, even build communal nesting sites, though they may not look like human metropolises. And let's not forget octopuses, which are probably the smartest non-human animals on Earth. They can learn to distinguish between real and virtual objects and engineer their environment. However, adapting to life on land might be tricky for them. You see, there's a lot we don't know about animal intelligence. And let's be honest, we humans have been quite arrogant about it throughout history. In the past, people used to think that animal intelligence could be neatly organized into a hierarchy with humans at the top and insects at the bottom. But in the 1960s, a new generation of researchers challenged this idea and suggested that intelligence should be measured in relative rather than absolute terms. As technology has improved, we've been able to see animals for longer without disturbing them, and we've discovered they are far more intelligent than we once thought. For example, researchers in Melbourne are using remote-controlled drones to study the breeding patterns of southern right whales, and artificial intelligence is helping us track and predict the movements of all sorts of creatures. It's funny how we tend to recognize intelligence in animals when their behavior is similar to our own. Dolphins, for example, use names and even have accents. In fact, researchers have found that dolphins in southern Brazil have developed a distinct accent after interacting with local fishers for over a hundred years. But it's not just mammals that are intelligent. Birds and insects are pretty smart too. Parrots, for example, have complex social groups and can differentiate between members of their species based on their relationships with each other. And even though their brains are tiny, like mine, insects are capable of some pretty impressive cognitive feats, like tool use and learning by observation. We used to think that intelligence was unique to humans and maybe a few other primates, but now we know that's not the case. In fact, research has shown that intelligence is distributed in different ways across the animal kingdom. Some animals excel in one area, but may not be as good in another. It's all about the environmental pressures that each species faces and how they adapt to them. We all know about the usual suspects when it comes to high intelligence in the animal kingdom, Chimps, dogs, dolphins, blah blah blah. But there are some unexpected additions to the list that might surprise you. And you might even have one of them napping in your lap right now. I'm talking about our feline friends, house cats. They're renowned masters of getting treats and avoiding baths. But did you know they're also pretty smart? Cats have an amazing ability to learn from observation and repetition, which is why we've coined the term copycats. And some cats, like the one in this next story named Nora, take it to the next level. Nora's owner spends her days teaching kids to play piano, and this cat was getting a little jealous of all the attention they were receiving. So what did she do? She watched them closely, picked up on their movements, and started tapping away at the keys herself. And you know what? It worked. Nora's owner and the kids were amazed, and Nora became a little bit of a piano sensation. She even sits at the piano like a proper piano student. Just because she doesn't have opposable thumbs doesn't mean she can't be a musical prodigy, but wider paws would help to hit those octaves. The next story is about rats. Now don't jump on the couch in fear just yet. And before you go calling them pests, did you know that some rats are actually helping save lives? Researchers in Africa have been training these furry little detectives to sniff out lung disease in saliva samples. And they're really good at it, too. These rats have a nose for the job and can detect different scents that are needed to show whether a sample contains a certain bacterium or not. Now, you might be wondering why rats were chosen for this important job. It's because they're super smart and quick learners. These rats go through a series of training exercises to learn how to sniff out different samples. They then alert their trainers to which samples hold bacteria. And get this, they can do it in just 7 minutes a task that would take a human scientist a full day of testing, these rats can do in a fraction of the time. Dr. Rat. Now, ever heard of Nellie the pig? She's surely not your average swine. 
this clever piggy has proved that animal intelligence goes way beyond just performing tricks. Nelly was presented with a series of challenges, including putting differently shaped items through a hoop. Now, while she was being taught to put round objects through a round hoop, Nelly decided to take it to the next level. When presented with objects that weren't round, she compared their shape with a hoop before deciding they wouldn't fit. This pig has some serious problem-solving skills. It's fascinating to see how pig brains process spatial awareness and solve different tasks. Who knew these curly-tailed creatures were such smarty pants? Now, elephants are probably some of the most amazing animals on Earth, not just because of their looks. They are not only cute, but they're also super smart and empathetic. These gentle giants are known for their incredible cooperation and coordination skills, which they use to protect their families and scare away their enemies. In the wild, elephants travel in clans and communicate with each other using low-frequency rumbles. They work together to keep their young ones safe from predators, and they're not afraid to show their dominance by kidnapping calves from competing clans. Researchers have found out that elephants are quick learners and can work together to achieve a common goal. They even show empathy toward each other, which is a pretty rare feature in the animal kingdom. For instance, elephants have a special interest in the remains of their own kind. They'll linger near elephant bones and investigate sticks of ivory much longer than they would pieces of wood. Also, when an elephant is feeling upset, other elephants will come to comfort it by stroking its head with their trunks or even putting their trunk in its mouth. Now, how sweet is that? In 2010, one elephant in particular really impressed scientists with his skills. He was seeing eyeing some tasty fruit just out of his trunk's reach. After pondering for a few days, he had his aha moment. He discovered a large plastic block and used it as a stepping stool to reach the fruit. He continued to use his newfound tool skills to reach even higher places, stacking blocks to get his favorite treat. Some strange seismic activity begins all over the world. Volcanoes on the planet are waking up. But instead of lava, fiery stones, and black ash, they release an invisible gas that slowly fills the atmosphere. This gas is safe for all mammals and insects, but for some reason, it harms people. Gas masks, medication, nothing helps. It's like Earth says, hey people, I've had enough, get out of here. To survive, humanity decides to move to a place where the gas can't reach, underwater. We begin global migration to the seas and oceans. The first thing we need to do is build underwater cities. Engineers use anti-corrosive metals and building materials that are not destroyed by moisture, so there are no problems with the construction. But there are too many people on the planet, which means we need to move further and further from the shore, and the deeper the bottom, the stronger the pressure. To build an ordinary underwater house, it's necessary to create equipment capable of withstanding the water column. Also, it requires expensive materials. Stainless steel is not enough. There should be strong alloys of metals to resist colossal pressure. All of this takes a lot of time, and while some are building cities moving deeper foot by foot, others are crowding in coastal parts. Ponds and lakes are becoming the best places to live. First, it's much easier to swim in fresh water. People spend much less energy and time on movements there. Secondly, Fresh water doesn't require powerful filtration used in seas and oceans. And thirdly, there are fewer people in ponds and lakes, which makes the water cleaner. Therefore, all the rich people live there, and the poor survive in the oceans. Famous auto brands create stylish submarines and closed boats with filtration systems. Scientists, together with engineers, come up with a technology that quickly extracts oxygen from water. One box with this technology constantly fills every house with fresh air. And another special box sucks all the carbon dioxide out of the room and releases it into the water. Clothing brands create stylish diving suits. The ocean is cold, so designers install a heating system inside clothing. People used to collect sneakers, but now they wear fashionable fins. There are thousands of fin designs with various engravings and patterns. People create underwater mills to generate electricity and build underwater vacuum pipes inside which high-speed trains drive. 
but the most remarkable thing is aquatic farms, where livestock eats grass and seeds. There are also incubators with plants that produce extra oxygen. The human body is also changing. The skin becomes smoother and the muscles get stronger. Life in the ocean is a continuous overcoming of water resistance. And you also need to carry an oxygen tank with you. So every day is like a good training in a gym. Take a look at the Olympic swimming champions. Now, most people have such a figure. Doctors, biologists, and engineers unite to create unique masks that allow people to breathe in the water like fish without oxygen tanks. People get much less sunlight underwater and lose vitamin D. This causes depression and weakens the immune system. To fix this problem, scientists build huge ultraviolet lamps that illuminate the entire seabed. People are getting used to a new life. In a sense, it's not much different from the previous one. Everyone also goes to cafes, cinemas, shopping, and the gym. People get an education, work, and use the same law system. Only now, instead of walking down the streets, they swim. Water resources are rich in oil, minerals, and other valuable things. This ensures the growth of the economy. Megacities have appeared in the deep waters of the oceans, and seas and lakes are becoming resorts. The conditions on the surface have become completely unsuitable for humans, and the next generations don't even know what it is like to live on land. Meanwhile, tracks of people on the surface disappear. Abandoned houses are overgrown with moss and vines. Animals fill cities. Seismic activity causes earthquakes that carry all buildings underground. Humanity made room for a new species, fish. Several hundred million years ago, the ocean was inhabited by giant monsters. The smaller fish couldn't fight these big guys, so they swam as close to the shore as possible. Then, over the years of evolution, they began to change. Fish grew limbs and learned to crawl on the ground. And so, after a couple hundred million years, they began to turn into mammals. And after that, people appeared. At least, that's what the theory of evolution says. Approximately the same story happened with modern fish. Only instead of sea monsters, they faced people in the ocean. Bright light, oxygen consumption, emissions of harmful gases, and garbage forced the fish to migrate first into the depths of the oceans. And then, as humans began to master the depths, the fish swam to the surface. But not because there wasn't enough space in the ocean, but because people started catching too much fish. It's problematic to grow grains, fruits, and vegetables underwater, even in closed farms. Therefore, to replenish the food supply, people just started fishing. To survive, the marine inhabitants had to swim to the surface. Now fish grow limbs to crawl. But when the dangers of people are left behind, the fish face a new problem – mammals. The population of bears, tigers, wolves, and all animals has increased since people left the surface. Now the predators are the rulers of the continent. The hardest struggle for survival begins. Fish learn to disguise themselves to hide from enemies. Many grow venomous spines, while others gain the ability to strike hard with their fins. But octopuses evolve the least. These clever creatures are the first to grab sticks and stones to fend off bears. They learn to dig holes in the ground and pluck fruit from trees. And soon, they become heads of the sea kingdom. Meanwhile, people are building powerful spaceships to find another planet to inhabit. There's too little space in the ocean, and the water is too dirty. Ventilation systems are pumping too much oxygen out of the ocean, releasing a lot of carbon dioxide. Seaweed and photoplankton, which provide more than half of the world's oxygen reserves, are disappearing because of human activity. People understand they have to leave Earth. Gradual migration begins. Humanity has been evacuated from the planet on giant ships for several centuries. They're flying to an exoplanet, just a couple hundred light years from Earth. Octopuses are becoming more intelligent than mammals. They see millions of giant ships flying out of the ocean and rising to the sky. The picture seems familiar to them. There's a memory of similar events somewhere in the depths of their DNA. The brain of octopuses develops faster thanks to the gas coming from the volcanoes. 
they become full-fledged masters of Earth. Animals and fish live next to them as pets. Then the octopuses build houses, invent the wheel, and open fire. From this moment, a new history of the planet begins – the era of octopuses. They create their civilization and find traces of the old one. Archaeologists with tentacles suggest that strange creatures lived on Earth once upon a time. They had four limbs and could walk upright. These creatures built their civilization here, but something happened, and these guys just disappeared. And while the octopuses are trying to figure out what happened to the previous civilization, people surf the expanses of space and meet a new, highly intelligent life. These humanoids look like octopuses since they have long tentacles, large eyes, and a developed brain. They tell people that once upon a time, they lived on planet Earth. But then plants and trees began to emit something called oxygen that poisoned the air. At first, the octopuses hid in the ocean, but oxygen filled the water. So they decided to leave the planet. Some of them adapted to the new conditions and stayed in the water with the fish. People tell them what happened next, including the history of humankind. The space octopuses realize that the story has now looped. Try to imagine what it would be like if you woke up one day and everything around you was pink. And I mean literally, not just having a think pink vibe. Everything from your walls to your bed, desk, armchair, and even the clothes you wear would be rosy. Would you be able to live in such a world for a whole week? Your first thought might be, is there something wrong with my eyes? For most people, the answer is no. Even if there was something wrong with your vision, the chances are you wouldn't end up seeing just one single color for the rest of your life. Most people who are colorblind are born that way. Even though there are rare cases in which you can develop this condition later in life. And even those people who are totally colorblind see the world only in black, white, and gray. Most people with colorblindness have problems perceiving certain colors. Their greatest difficulty is distinguishing the shades of the same color. But let's get back to our pink world, shall we? Is pink a special color for our brain? When you think about pink objects, you most likely associate them with emotions like love and kindness. In some cases, looking at the color pink for longer periods of time can actually make people feel more agitated. In sports, teams have been known to paint the opposing team's locker room pink in an attempt to decrease their energy and performance. This tactic was implemented by an American coach who believed the all-pink room would mess with the minds of the opposing teams. What if I told you that this specific shade of pink you woke up to had special powers, though? In the 1970s, a scientist named Alexander Schaus found a color that made people feel calm and relaxed. After lots of experiments to test the effects of different colors on people's behavior, he found this specific color which he named the Schaus Pink. His study showed that when people looked at a bright color, they lost strength in their muscles. But when they looked at the color blue, their strength returned to normal. The researcher talked about this in public lectures and even showed it on TV. He invited a bodybuilder and concluded that they could not do a single bicep curl after staring at the pink color. Schaus was so sure of his discovery that he even suggested that prisons should paint holding cells pink to calm people down. Two officers at a U.S. prison tested this idea by painting one holding cell pink and found that some inmates became calmer after being in the pink cell for 15 minutes. In any case, Schaus's original research hasn't been proven to be true by the following studies, but that doesn't mean you can't test it out for yourself. There's no way to tell how your brain might react to living in a pink world for a day, a week, or even a whole month. It all has to do with your previous experience with this color. If it was a happy one, you might actually like living in a pink environment. However, it may be hard on your eyes after a certain point. But we can't say that the colors we surround ourselves with don't affect us. Carl Jung, a famous Swiss psychoanalyst, developed a theory of color psychology, also known as Jungian color theory. He believed that each color meant something different somewhere in the back of our mind and had the power to reveal deeper thoughts. He thought that colors could be used 
to understand an individual's innermost thoughts and feelings. For example, he considered the color blue to be formal and precise, while green made people feel relaxed and patient. While looking at the color yellow, people became more sociable, and if you liked the color red, it meant you were competitive and strong-willed. Pink isn't the only color people have studied to see its effects on the brain. Let's take green for instance. Would you feel better living in a green world? Well, looking at this color can actually help you focus better. Studies have shown that people who take short breaks to look at pictures of green things like trees or grass concentrate better on boring tasks and make fewer mistakes. This is because green is a soothing color that is easy for our eyes and brain to see. I mean, it's the color we often find in nature, so it's no wonder most of us find it soothing. When it comes to red and orange, we should use these in moderation. So, no orange houses for me, thank you. These colors can make you feel more energized and active, but too much can be bad. Researchers concluded that being surrounded by red or orange for long periods of time can make us fussy. Let's not forget about blue. It can make you feel calm and rested, but it can also make you feel gloomy, especially those darker shades. Waking up in a blue world might come with its own set of problems, depending on the shade. Then there's the problem with blue light. It's the type of light screens emit. At times, it can be bad for your sleep because such a light can trick your brain into thinking it's still daylight. It can make it hard for your body to produce the hormones you need to fall asleep at the right hours. To avoid these issues, it's a good idea to avoid blue light screens for at least an hour before bed. How about our eyes? Is staring at the same color for longer periods of time any good for us? Not really. If you look at one color for a long time, for starters, it can change the way you see other colors. Back in the day, people used old computer screens that featured a lot of green hues. Because they were exposed to this color a lot during a normal working day, they would see everything with a purple tint for a while after they stopped using the computer. The explanation is simple. The part of the eye that was responsible for seeing green got tired. It got compensated by other parts of the eye that were more rested, those responsible for the red and blue hues. What do you get when you combine red with blue? That's right, purple. These days, most people use computer screens that are white with black letters, so this problem doesn't happen as much. This change in our eyesight is also explained by the McCullough effect. It's a phenomenon that happens when people perceive a change in color of an object after it has been looked at for a long period of time. In 1965, Celeste McCullough found out that if you looked at colorful stripes for too long, it could affect how you saw things for months. Her experiment had people looking at colorful stripes, then at black and white ones. If you do this for long enough, you'll end up seeing the monochrome lines in color too. Just like how a camera flash can make your vision go blurry for a bit, this effect can last for a long time if you look at the stripes for too long. Does the color you stare at make any difference to your eyesight? Well, not really. There is no evidence to suggest that a certain color can trigger the McCullough effect. It's rather caused by a combination of factors, like changes in the way the brain processes visual information, fatigue of the eye muscles, and changes in the way the eye's retina responds to light. What about light? Exposure to some sunlight is important for our well-being, but you've surely heard this one since you were little. Don't stare directly at the sun. Is there really any evidence that it affects our eyes? Or is it just another myth? Turns out, it is indeed dangerous. When you stare at the sun for an extended period, ultraviolet light enters your eyes. It then gets through the internal lens onto the retina and reaches the back of the eye. When this light-sensitive tissue is exposed to UV rays, it can get damaged. You'll end up seeing spots for longer than just a few seconds or even have permanent eyesight damage. This process can happen quickly, even in just a few seconds of direct sun gazing. It was hot in the tropics, a type of heat unknown to the men aboard the Nina, the Pinta, and the Santa Maria ships led by Italian explorer Christopher Columbus. It had been months since these men left their home cities in Europe. 
And until then, Europe was all they knew. They were given a difficult and even dangerous task. Spain hired Columbus to find a new western route to Asia. They needed new routes for trading and buying spices, but it was far from a simple job. I mean, crossing the ocean never is. Little did those sailors know that their lives were about to change forever. Land in sight! Someone must have shouted on board. But when they finally stepped on that new foreign land, they discovered they were not in Asia. They had landed in the Americas. You've probably heard this tale before. Historically speaking, Columbus arrived in the Americas in 1492. But what would have happened if Columbus's ship had faced a lethal storm in the Atlantic Ocean and had never made it to the new land? What would today's history look like? First things first, nobody discovered anything. When we say that the Americas were discovered, we're kind of ignoring the millions of people who already lived there. You see, the Americas were only discovered from Europe's point of view. Columbus would only have discovered something if when he got there, he was faced with acres and acres of empty land. But that was not the case at all. Second, Columbus was not the first explorer to land in the Americas. Believe it or not, the Vikings approached American shores in the 10th century. Their expeditions have been well documented and accepted by scholars. Here's what might have happened. Around the year 1000 CE, Viking explorer Leif Erikson sailed to a place called Vinland. Cute name, huh? It's now a region in Canada called Newfoundland. But his crew didn't stay too long. They arrived to find 10 Native Americans napping under their overturned canoes. They attempted some trade, but I'm guessing the Vikings weren't too friendly and the Americans didn't really like them. The Vikings' account of the encounter shows they felt outnumbered and menaced, so they sailed away back to their land. That makes sense, right? As I said earlier, there were millions of people living in the ginormous continent of the Americas. Any foreigner would be outnumbered there. Now take a look at what North America looked like before our buddy Chris got there. It was not divided into the normal states we're used to. And if Columbus had never arrived, the United States would probably never have been united to begin with. After all, there were hundreds of first Americans living in these lands, and they lived amongst their own tribes, quite different from the Europeans. It's not accurate to think that there were no political systems going on in the Americas before Europeans arrived. We just need to understand that they were different from what we're used to today. When Europeans arrived, they imported their belief systems with them, from religious beliefs and language systems to things as simple as clothing habits. If the Americas had developed on their own, maybe their sense of fashion would be completely different today. You see, Europeans had a developed sense of fashion by the time they arrived in the West. They wore things such as this and this. But those don't really work in the tropics, do they? For them, Fashion had to do with showing a certain economic status, while in the Americas, that didn't exist. For Native Americans, clothing was mainly functional and related to the weather. In warmer climates, Native people would wear short-like cloths to cover their intimate parts. They would walk bare-chested and use shoes known as moccasins. Yes, similar to the moccasins you probably own. In colder climates, they would resort to using leather and fur parkas. Of course, there was always the special clothing used for ceremonial purposes. So I'm guessing that if Columbus never reached the Americas, brands such as the Gap, Hollister, and Forever 21 would have never existed. But we could live with that, couldn't we? Here's a wild thought. Let's say that by the 1700s, Native Americans had developed complex engineering skills. They built big boats, maybe a bit smaller in size than the traditional European ships, and decided to venture across the ocean. Let's say they were the ones who arrived on European shores, in places such as Spain and Portugal. They carried gifts and goods with them for trading, of course. This was also a common practice amongst them back home, known as potlatch. Sure, they were received with suspicion by the Europeans, who had only ever traded with Asia. But with this inverted encounter, a different type of relationship began between Native Americans and Europeans. Since Europeans didn't claim ownership of the Americas, 
the people from the so-called new land weren't considered inferior to them. Actually, they stood side by side as equals, each one with their own power and set of knowledge. Native Americans taught Europeans a new type of ruling system, a more decentralized one. So modern-day structures of government would look really different. Maybe Europeans decided that four years was a long time for someone to hold decision power, so they implemented smaller and more frequent elections. Oh, and the landscape of European cities also changed a lot. Instead of huge statues made of copper and bronze showing men and ships on their way to the Americas, the Europeans built totem poles in honor of their alliances with first Americans. In terms of medical and medicinal knowledge, they had a lot to exchange about. While Europeans were making advances in traditional medicine, Americans had developed an impressive knowledge of herbs that could heal a series of things. Before they knew it, Europeans were selling different varieties of plants in their pharmaceutical establishments. They had one big barrier though, language. Since Europeans never arrived on American shores, they also never taught their language to Americans. So maybe in this scenario, both cultures brought in their best linguists and tried creating a new language from scratch. Something that could be comprehensible from both perspectives and that could encompass both of their worldviews. The implications of this on modern day life would be really profound if you stop to think about it. Let's say that this newly created language involved some symbols and drawings in it. You see, Native Americans often told stories using symbols known as pictograms. They were quite literal sometimes. As you can see, a mountain was represented by, well, a mountain. It's crazy to think that this system of communication has been around for 5,000 years since it was actually invented by the Sumerians. And hey, maybe even our laptop keyboards would come equipped with these symbols, and you could write more visually hybrid and fun emails than the ones you write today. The American landscape would have also changed. You see, if neither Columbus nor any of the other European dudes that went after him reached the so-called new land, Central and Latin American cities would look completely different than they do today. Maybe the bustling empires of the time, such as the Inca, the Maya, and the Aztec, would have grown immensely. To be fair, they were already pretty big by the time Europeans got there. Some pre-Columbian Maya cities were as big as medieval London and Paris in terms of population. But oh my, the Mayan Empire would have grown so much that it could have spread out all over of Central America. They could have developed their pyramid building craft up to the point that they managed to build an even larger pyramid than the Giza Pyramid in Egypt. So tourists would come from all over the world to visit. Ah, and in South America, let's just say the region could have turned into a huge forest, bigger than the Amazon. The Inca could have spread through the Andes and then into the mainland. Places such as Brazil and Argentina never existed. But in their place, there would have been dreamy tropical settlements, which would have become a worldwide reference in sustainable living. So, imagine you're 15 and you get bored of playing video games. Instead, to pass the time, you decide to give some attention to an old hobby of yours, tracking down lost Mayan cities. You've heard that some ancient civilizations are said to have built entire cities based on constellations, so you decide to check out whether that was true for the Mayans. You find a book containing all the constellations the Mayan civilization believed to exist. You open good old Google Maps and map every ancient Mayan city discovered to date. You start seeing that this information actually matches. And truly, the biggest ancient Mayan cities correspond to the brightest and biggest stars of the Mayan constellations. Okay, this is getting interesting. You manage to map out over 100 ancient cities when you suddenly notice something strange. There's an area in the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico where archaeologists have unearthed two Mayan cities. But on the constellation map, there are three stars. Could this mean there is a long-lost city waiting to be discovered nearby? You might think this sounds too daydreamy, but the story is actually true. The previous account happened to a Canadian teenager named William Gaddery. The boy is known as a science genius and had even won an award for the constellation theory we presented just now. When he noticed that a third city was missing from the 23rd constellation he was examining, 
he began to scour the internet for satellite pictures that could help him solve this mystery. He looked into images from NASA, JAXA, a Japan-based satellite company, and Google Earth. These images were still insufficient to answer his questions. So he reached out to a friend inside the Canadian Space Agency. His friend provided him with state-of-the-art satellite imagery that gave him the answer he was looking for. According to the images, there is a large square area right on the border of Mexico and Belize which looks like the remains of a city. William took the images to a remote sensing expert known as Dr. Armin LaRogue from the University of New Brunswick. They studied the images thoroughly and concluded that the area could be housing 30 buildings and even a large pyramid. The scientific and archaeological community went crazy with the 15-year-old's discovery. Could this really be true? Some background. Lost Mayan cities began to be unearthed in the mid-20th century. Since then, ruins from cities such as Tikal, Palenik, and Uxmal have been rediscovered. The Mayans were one of the biggest pre-Columbian civilizations living in the Americas. They began to settle in the area as early as 1500 BCE. Experts believe that, at its height, the Mayan civilization consisted of over 40 cities with a population of millions of people. That's a crowd. And their cities were pretty interesting. Their civilization spanned over Mexico's Yucatan Peninsula, Guatemala, and Belize. They survived mainly on agriculture, so they developed a complex irrigation system in most of their cities. They built a series of ceremonial buildings, pyramids, plazas, and even courts for ball games. The Mayans were keen pyramid builders, but they also developed an advanced astronomical system. With whatever ancient technology they had, they were able to predict the exact location of planets, such as Venus and Mars, and they were able to predict the exact dates of eclipses. That's why the methodology William used to discover this long-lost Mayan city was unusual, but not completely surreal. The Mayans were keen astronomers, so it wouldn't be too strange that they built their major architectural feats in relation to the sky, would it? And they wouldn't be the first ones to be doing so. There is a famous fringe of Egyptology dedicated to studying how the Giza pyramids were built in perfect alignment with the Orion constellation, meaning that each pyramid was purposely built to align with one of the major stars of Orion's belt. According to William, he first had the idea to look at the Mayan constellations because he couldn't understand why the Mayans built their cities where they built them. Most major cities, such as Chichen Itza and Uxmal, aren't near any rivers or significant bodies of water. Instead, they're built on marginal lands and on top of mountains, which confused the 15-year-old. His next thought was that it might have something to do with astronomy. William named the new city he discovered Mouth of Fire, which is also my nickname, and he even won a merit award for his hard work. However, his theory was very much contested inside the archaeological community, and many Mayan experts worked to debunk William's findings. Some archaeologists say that constellation theories are too unscientific. Anthony Aveni, a renowned anthropologist and astronomer, referred to William's methodology as an act of creative imagination. He explained that there is no way to be sure what the Mayan constellations really were, it's all just hypothetical. Another debunking of William's findings came from Mayanist David Stewart, who said that the object identified on the satellite imagery is nothing but an old cornfield. His claim was supported by an expedition that took place near the area in 2021, when the archaeologists present reported there was nothing at all in this area. Still, a 15-year-old boy almost found a long-lost Mayan city, which is pretty exciting if you ask me. Similar techniques as those used by William are actually being used to unearth lost civilizations all over the world. According to space archaeologist Sarah Parquet, satellite imagery has been a key player in discovering ancient cities in Egypt and other places. Sarah herself spends most of her days scouring images for any sign of where there could have been cities long ago. What happens, she says, is that any time you have something buried, it's going to be covered either by vegetation, soil or sand, or some other modern construction on top of it. In order to assess whether there is something hidden under large canopies of vegetation or not, 
She uses infrared technology, for instance. A major recent discovery in Brazil was done in a similar way. Satellite imagery detected a network of trenches dating back to 200 to 1200 CE. These suggest settlements that could have supported around 60,000 people. But in this case, the satellite imagery did indeed correspond to what was on the ground. Researchers from the University of Florida found several mounds that were accompanied by ditches and geoglyphs. Archaeologists also found remnants of carefully designed walls, centered around plazas, much like the type of construction done by the ancient Mayans. Advances in satellite tech have also shed new light on long-discovered ancient Mayan cities, such as Tikal. Located in the heart of the Guatemalan jungle, Tikal is believed to have been the capital of the ancient Mayan Empire. At its height, it was comparable in importance to cities such as London or New York in today's world. It was composed of a series of complex monuments, many of them believed to have been the resting places of kings and chiefs. Tikal is already known to have been big, but recent discoveries show it could have been even three times larger than what scientists originally believed. The main discovery revolves around a fortification on the outskirts of the city, indicating how far the original city stretched. And new discoveries still take place. In 2017, researchers also unearthed new clues regarding the potential causes of the decline of the Mayan civilization. Using data from a site in Siwol, located 62 miles southwest of Tikal, scientists analyzed radiocarbon data from ceramics and archaeological excavations to extract new information about the sudden demise of this great civilization. The information shows that, instead of a sudden collapse, the Mayans most likely collapsed in waves of social instability and political crises. These events are believed to have deteriorated Mayan city centers and began causing the dispersion of the Mayan population. Well, it seems like it's a prime time to uncover ancient ruins. What do you say? Will you give it a try as well? Ever since Plato wrote about the allegory of Atlantis, humanity has been fascinated with the possibility of the discovery of a thriving underwater civilization. Fancy joining me on a trip to a few historic underwater sites? Let's see what we can find out about ancient civilizations. The first one on our list is what is being called the Underwater Stonehenge. Scientists have recently discovered a mysterious pile of cairns that stretch for miles under the shimmering waters of Lake Constance at the borders of Switzerland, Germany, and Austria. Archaeologists began to explore the site back in 2015, and they haven't been able to understand yet what it was actually used for. What they do know is that there is a 12-mile line of 170 human-made stone cairns under Lake Constance. Scientists say this was most likely the result of a combined work of several villages. The cairn site was probably used for some collective purpose. The formations are huge. Some of them are several dozen feet wide. The most amazing discovery so far is that the site dates back to around 5,500 years ago. Now, what were we humans doing back then? We were living in the prime years of the so-called Stone Age. We were beginning to make artifacts from stone and use them to hunt and eat. Can you imagine what a knife and fork might have looked like back in those days? It's no coincidence that scientists call this site the Underwater Stonehenge, though. Both sites are believed to have been built around the same period of time. You see, Stonehenge dates back to around 3100 BCE. Both sites carry the distinct characteristic of stone monuments built in a circle. Not to mention the fact that scientists also haven't figured out why on earth our early ancestors would feel the need to build a monument such as Stonehenge. Well, the mystery of Lake Constance hasn't been solved yet. Who were the Neolithic people from this area? And for what purpose did they go through such an amount of work and effort to build this huge stone site? Next, we're taking you on a tour of the Ryukyu Islands just off the coast of Japan. You're diving deep down to an archaeological site. But I should warn you, 
the waters of the Pacific Ocean are far from smooth. It doesn't take long before you see a huge structure, thanks to the sunlight shining down on the seabed. At first, it looks like Machu Picchu's ruins located across the globe in Peru. As you approach the site, you slowly figure out its forms. A pyramid-shaped structure, arches, staircases, it's something that could have easily been a palace or a castle. Could this be a sign of human activity? What you've just seen is known today as the Yonaguni Monument. It also goes by the name of Japan's Atlantis. The entire monument is about the size of five soccer fields and the height of a five-story building. Its most surprising feature is its expanse of terraces. Explorers and scientists believe that Yonaguni might be 10,000 years old. But whether it's a human-made structure or a natural formation is still under debate. For Japan's top marine geologist, Professor Masaki Kimura, Yonaguni is the heritage of a lost civilization. Kimura has dived to the bottom of the ocean to explore the ruins over 100 times over the past 10 years. According to him, there are clear signs of human activity down there. On the monument's surface, there is a triangle-shaped concave that is a historical symbol of water fountains in the region. There is also a giant turtle carved on the eastern side of the structure. And, according to Kimura, turtles have an important cultural meaning. Several pieces of stone tools have been recovered from the site. Their estimated age is around 10,000 years. However, not all scientists support this theory. For many, Yonaguni is the result of thousands of years of erosion. The fact that the monument is composed of one massive rock leads them to believe it's not human-made. The defined edges and flat surfaces resemble a natural formation in Northern Ireland known as the Giant's Causeway. The basalt columns look like the ruins of a palace, but they're actually the result of volcanic activity in the region. Now, you're flying to the coast of Greece, four hours away from Athens. More specifically, you're in the Peloponnese Peninsula. You dust off an old snorkel and head for a free dive on a bright sunny day. Sometime into the dive, you start noticing patterns on a seabed. 13 feet below the surface, outlines of familiar objects start to appear, one by one. As you continue swimming, what looks like the outline of an entire city emerges in front of your eyes. Are you wondering how water could have taken the whole city? Rocks are perfectly aligned into what appears to be the foundation of a building. This is Pavlopetri, an ancient city you've probably heard about for the first time. It was discovered by Nicholas Fleming, a British oceanographer, when he was on vacation in Greece. He had heard rumors about Pavlopetri's existence and, indeed, found several artifacts on the seafloor. He went back to the area a year later with the team. They found a site filled with pots, storage vessels, and tools. A kern stone, for instance, is a tool used for grinding grains and turning them into flour. Multiple amphoras indicate that this settlement dates back to the Bronze Age, 5,500 years ago, when people started living in towns. The settlement is believed to have existed for over 2,400 years. Today, Pavlopetri is considered the oldest submerged town ever discovered. And what's impressive is that it wasn't a simple village. It was a vibrant port city with stone buildings, a marketplace, streets, and even squares. The next stop on our voyage is one of today's most famous underwater cities that has been turned into an archeological park. The city of Port Royal in Jamaica exists only below the surface, but in 1692, it was one of the wealthiest cities in the Western Hemisphere. Port Royal was the center of the British Empire at the time and an important trade city that attracted people from all over the region. It was also home to real-life pirates of the Caribbean. On the morning of June 7, 1692, the people of Port Royal met a different fate than they had probably expected. 
the city woke up shaking. People were thrown out of their beds by the power of a massive earthquake, ranking 7.5 on a Richter scale. One survivor said he had seen Earth opening up and swallowing the whole town. What he said could be true, as the city was mainly built on sand. The ground swallowed buildings, roads, you name it. Geysers erupted, and finally, waves as big as 10-story buildings hit the city. About 33 acres of the city disappeared under the water. Amazingly, most of its 17th century remains are still in good condition under 40 feet of water. Archaeologists have found taverns, storage rooms, kitchens, and recreational buildings used for diverse purposes. You can also see a grand lion statue, a submerged bridge, and many picturesque arches. Of course, I saved the best for last, India. Just off its coast lies another sunken marvel. A site known as the Lost City of Cambay is located in the Gulf with a similar name. It remained undiscovered until 2001, when the National Institute of Ocean Technology made a routine water assessment. With the help of sonar technology, which sends a wave sound to the bottom of the sea, they found something far beneath the surface. Images showed well-defined geometric shapes spread along a five-mile stretch. The remains date to more than 9,500 years ago, meaning this civilization was lost at around the end of the Ice Age. Debris recovered from the site included construction material, pottery, beads, sculptures, and even bones. Scientists argue whether these artifacts are indeed from the site, but if they truly are, then the lost city of Cambay might be the oldest civilization in the world. Okay, let's play a little guessing game, shall we? Can you name the sixth largest river on Earth in terms of volume? That's the amount of water that flows through a waterway. The first couple of rivers are easy to list. Number one, of course, is the Amazon River in South America. Then we have the Congo in Africa and the Ganges in India. Feel free to name all the rivers on the planet. You won't get any closer to the answer. Why? Because this river is not on the surface, but underneath the waves of the Black Sea. In 2010, a team of scientists discovered this river while studying the Bosphorus Strait in Turkey. Sonar scanning revealed a channel at the bottom of the Black Sea. The channel had water flowing through it. It turned out that at places, it's 115 feet deep. That's three times as tall as your average telephone pole. This flow of water acts like a real river. It has rapids and waterfalls, and its volume is 350 times greater than that of the River Thames in London. Huh, talk about a strong undercurrent. If it was a surface river, it would really be in the top 10. Bad news for the Madeira River in Bolivia and Brazil, the present number six. But how did this underwater river form? The answer lies in the amazing features of the Black Sea. It gets its water from two main sources. The first are the rivers that flow into it, like the Danube, Dnieper, and Don. <laughs> a lot of Ds there. But more importantly, they are all freshwater waterways. On the other side, quite literally, there is the Mediterranean. And it's salty, like a lot. When this salt water gets inside the Black Sea, it goes straight to the bottom. You see, fresh water is lighter than salt water. This creates stratification. It's a fancy term that simply means that the two types of water don't mix together. Salt water has a higher density, so it drops right down to the bottom. If you want to see how that works, you can do an experiment at home. Pour mineral water into one cup and salt water into another. Table salt will do. Then put a grape in each cup you'll see how it immediately sinks to the bottom of the cup filled with fresh water. The grape will stay afloat in the cup filled with salt water. The same thing is happening inside the Black Sea. But there is another side to this phenomenon. The upper layer of water is rich in oxygen. This means it can support life. The bottom layer, however, is anoxic. Yep, you guessed it. This means there is no oxygen at the bottom. But this isn't a bad thing. Because of this trait of the Black Sea, shipwrecks are able to survive for centuries. Oxygen decomposes wood. 
And from what material did the ancient people make their ships? That's correct, timber. Recently, in 2018, scientists discovered the oldest Greek shipwreck on Earth. The merchant ship lies more than a mile deep at the bottom of the sea. Experts estimate that the vessel is 2,400 years old. The wreck was valuable for historians to study all the elements of ancient ship construction. From the mast to the rowing benches, it's all intact. The wreck lies some 50 miles off the coast of Bulgaria, but no one has seen it in person. Explorers sent a deep-sea ROV, or remotely operated vehicle, to film the wreckage. It was impossible for a diver to go down. Hmm, but the Black Sea doesn't look that huge on a map. Could it be that deep? Oh yes, it's way deeper than people think. You could stack six Empire State Buildings at the deepest point of the Black Sea, around 7,257 feet. This inland sea isn't the only place on Earth where researchers have discovered shipwrecks and underwater rivers. One of the largest channels running along the ocean floor lies off the coast of South America. It runs from the mouth of the mighty Amazon and into the Atlantic Ocean. Studying underwater rivers isn't an easy task. The depth and the strong currents make it impossible to send in divers. Even the equipment for underwater research has to be sturdy. Otherwise, the current will just wash it away. That's why the underwater river in the Black Sea was ideal for scientists to explore. Earth's oceans and seas are powerful. But, lucky for us, there are places where divers can admire underwater rivers. Ever heard of a cenote? Sounds Spanish. Well, that's because it is. Cenotes are underground caves. They form after the limestone above collapses, revealing the groundwater under them. The term cenote is associated with the Yucatan Peninsula in Mexico. Ancient Maya used them as water sources. In the Mayan language, the word cenote meant sacred well. Researchers estimate there are some 10,000 cenotes spread across the Yucatan Peninsula. You can also find them in other places, such as Cuba and Australia. Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but unofficially, the most beautiful cenote is located just south of the town of Tulum in Mexico. The name reflects the cave's divine beauty, Cenote Angelita. But people don't visit this cenote to go swimming. Its bottom is much more interesting. A scuba tank is all you need to finally admire an underwater river firsthand. The waters are dark and foggy, so divers use powerful flashlights. After a hundred-foot dive, a marvelous sight appears. An underwater river with trees along its banks. Some of them even have green leaves, just like any other water flow on dry land. But it's not really a river. Here comes the fascinating part. Remember how salt water and fresh water don't mix? Well, the river the divers see is actually a thick layer of fog between the two types of water. Three feet of hydrogen sulfates to be exact. This is the compound that water processing plants use to remove chlorine from drinking water. The substance is so heavy that the fog it produces moves independently from the surrounding water and it creates an illusion that a river is flowing underwater. But there are other real rivers that play tricks on you. Take, for example, the Mystery River in Indiana. It's the longest underground river in the United States. Explorers discovered the river and its cave system, Blue Spring Caverns, in the 19th century. Nearly three miles of the river are navigable. Isn't that impressive? You can book a boat tour on a river that you can't even see. But the most mysterious river on the planet is the Saraswati River in India. The coolest part about it is that it doesn't exist. It was an alleged river only mentioned in ancient literature. For centuries, people thought that it was just a myth. Then satellite images showed that it might be real. Ancient texts spoke of a major confluence of three mighty rivers, the Ganges, Yamuna, and Saraswati. The first two are visible today, but where's the third one? That's what scientists decided to find out. Images from an American satellite 
showed the presence of underground water in the area. Until then, researchers thought that these were paleo channels. This simply means that water flowed through them a long time ago. But to their surprise, it appeared that there was still water inside these channels. Scientists estimated that the Saraswati River flowed above the ground some 5,000 years ago. But it didn't dry up completely. It just went underground, some 200 feet below the ground. Local experts believe that the river still slowly flows into the sea. The Saraswati River got hidden under the desert sand. This was a natural process, but many rivers have been forced underground because of human activity. In London, England, several dozen small and medium-sized rivers now flow under the ground. Maps from the 19th century still show them as rivers, but today they only exist in the names of the streets that were built above them, such as Fleet Street. The same thing happened in New York, but this doesn't mean that these streams have disappeared for good. When engineers want to rebuild or modify a building, they still consult city maps from centuries ago. No one wants a long-lost brook to flood their basement. Let's test to see how many spiral-shaped objects you can find around you right now. I'll bet there's more than you think. A spiral may be hidden in the flower petals of your houseplants. One might be staring at you from that seashell you brought home from your last trip to the beach. If none of these objects sound familiar, you might want to head over to the mirror and turn to the side a bit. In case you haven't noticed yet, even our own ears are shaped like a spiral. Why does Mother Nature seem to have such a preference for this shape? Many theories wish to explain this weird behavior. One of them is based on the Fibonacci sequence. This Italian mathematician didn't really care much for spirals initially. He was studying rabbits when he came up with this theory. Fibonacci came up with the sequence as a solution to a problem involving the growth of a population of rabbits. Let's recreate his experiment. If you put a pair of rabbits in an enclosed space, how many pairs of rabbits will you find there after a year? To solve this problem, Fibonacci proposed some conditions for his theoretical experiment. That all rabbits are born as a pair, one male, one female. Also, the rabbits can start reproducing after one month. More so, each pair of rabbits produces one pair of offspring each month. And lastly, none of the rabbits kicks the bucket at the end of the year. Now, using these assumptions, Fibonacci noticed the following sequence. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, 34, 55, 89, 144, and so on. The first two numbers in the sequence, 1, 1, represent the initial pair of rabbits. The next number, 2, represents the number of pairs of rabbits after the first month. One pair of the initial rabbits plus one pair of offspring. The fourth number, 3, represents the number of pairs after the second month. Two pairs of the initial rabbits plus one pair of offspring. And so on. He soon noticed that his series is made out of numbers in which each number is the sum of the previous two numbers. A lot of other mathematicians have looked at this sequence over the years. They were soon surprised to discover that this system was found in many natural structures, such as the arrangement of leaves on a stem and the arrangements of seeds on a sunflower. If you don't understand why it is so, then grab a piece of paper and a pen. Together, let's try to draw the Fibonacci spiral. You'll have to start with a small circle at the center of your page and then draw larger circles around it without lifting the pen from the paper, using the numbers from the Fibonacci sequence. For example, the first circle is 0 units wide, the second circle is 1 unit wide, the third circle is 1 unit wide, and so on. As you keep adding more circles, they will fit together perfectly to form a spiral shape. The spiral gets bigger and bigger, but it always follows the same pattern based on the Fibonacci sequence. Another famous spiralist was a man named James Bell Pettigrew. He was a Scottish naturalist that became fascinated by the mystery of the spiral shape, which he noticed almost everywhere in nature. He studied it at all scales, from giant nebulae in space to tiny molecules. Despite his research, he couldn't figure out where the spiral came from. He was sure that it couldn't be just a physical thing. 
and he believed that organs and plants and animals are not only shaped like spirals, but they also work in a spiral way. At the center of lifetime work on this unique shape was the human heart. Pettigrew believed that the heart's spiral structure was the mystery of all mysteries. He also thought this shape was to blame for both its muscular contractions and how the blood seemed to travel within our mighty tickers. The reason why the spiral seems to be everywhere might be really simple. Efficiency. Take a look at the basic sunflower, for example. It figured out a way to display its seeds so that it could expose them to the sun equally, without wasting any space and without being limited in their growth. Spiral stairs are another great example, too. They just work better. You find it easier to climb them, and they should take less space than the usual ones. We also might be more inclined to notice this shape more than others. That's because a spiral shape, or its proportions, is more aesthetically pleasing to the human eye. It's the reason why interior designers, artists, or illustrators often use these principles in their work. The spiral symbol is also the oldest symbol found in every civilized continent. Some historians believe that the spiral in Asian art may represent the sun as it has been found on roof tiles from the Tang Dynasty near the ancient city of Chang'an. It is also often found at burial sites, and scientists believe it to represent the circle of life, how we pass on and somehow be reborn. This is probably because in some ancient civilizations, people believed that the sun was born each day, extinguished itself each night, and was reborn the next day. You might have also stumbled upon the spiral as a symbol of hypnosis and dizziness. There's no real evidence that you can hypnotize someone by making them stare into a spiral for a certain time. But its effects on our abilities to focus and our optic nerves are significant. After you've stared at a spinning spiral for quite some time, you'll notice how objects either get smaller or bigger, depending on the direction of the spiral. It's easy to understand why some experience this sensation as hypnotizing. One of the most distinctive features of DNA is its spiral shape. It's also called a double helix. The double helix is formed when two strands of DNA twist around each other, like a ladder being twisted into a spiral shape. This spiral shape is important for many reasons. First, the spiral shape allows DNA to be compact and efficient. The double helix can pack a lot of genetic information into a small space, making it possible for cells to store vast amounts of genetic material in a small area. Second, the spiral shape allows DNA to be flexible and respond to changes in our environment. Because the double helix is made up of two strands that can move relative to each other, our DNA can change its shape. Finally, the spiral shape of DNA allows it to interact with other molecules in the cell. Now, let's look at the big picture. I mean, the biggest of them all, that of the galaxies found in our universe. They're also shaped like a spiral due to their rotation and the presence of dark matter. As the galaxy spins, the stars and gas clouds within the galaxy move in a circular direction around its center. This movement creates a spiral shape as the stars and gas clouds are drawn toward the center of the whole system. Additionally, the presence of dark matter, which is a type of matter that does not interact with light, creates gravitational forces that help to shape the galaxy into a spiral. But you don't need to look that far to understand why spirals are important. Your handy corkscrew is shaped like a spiral too, because it makes it easier for you to open the wine bottle. That screw you drilled into the wall to hang a picture? Also a spiral. It helps it with some added grip and stability. Got a notebook on your desk? Those pages might be held together by a spiraled wire. It makes it easier for you to browse the notebook without damaging the pages. Even your hair strands might have a curled shape. The curlier the hair, the drier it will be. It means it will get sebum from the scalp down on the strand slower, making it easier to maintain and clean. And before I spiral out of control, <laughs> we're done here. Imagine discovering an ancient city without leaving the comfort of your home. In 1963, a man in the Nevsehir province of Turkey did exactly that. He was renovating his house. He knocked down a wall in his basement and 
found a mysterious room. He continued digging and saw a tunnel. This is how Darren Kuyu Underground City was found. Darren Kuyu is one of the deepest multi-level underground settlements of Cappadocia and in all of Turkey. This engineering masterpiece has eight levels. The inhabitants living on those floors had access to cellars, storage areas, chapels, a school, a study room, and other structures. All floors are connected by an extensive network of tunnels. It's believed that the underground city was built as a shelter. You can't see the construction from the outside. Its depth is approximately 279 feet. The complex was large enough to shelter about 20,000 people, plus their livestock and food supplies. There's also a 180-foot ventilation shaft. People used it both for ventilation and as a well. The well supplied water both to the villagers living on the surface and to those hiding in the underground city. Interestingly, those living on the bottom levels were able to cut off the water supply for the upper and ground levels. This kept the water safe from potential poisoning. The place was designed for protection. The tunnels could be blocked from the inside with huge round rolling stone doors. The passageways were extremely narrow. Potential invaders had to enter the tunnels one at a time. Seems like they thought of everything in the 7th century BCE. Archaeologists believed the Phrygians were the ones who first built the levels. After them, the structure was used and enhanced in Roman times. This was when the chapels were added. The golden time of Darin Kuyu, however, was during the Byzantine era. But how did these people manage to create such tunnels? Well, the rock they carved them into wasn't usual. It was soft volcanic rock. It appeared due to a geological process that began millions of years ago. Volcanic eruptions covered the area in thick ash. It then solidified into this soft rock. When the natural forces of wind and water eroded softer parts, only hard elements remained. Fun fact, fairy chimneys are also made of intricately shaped volcanic soft rock, but they formed naturally without any human intervention. I'm still in Turkey, but this time, my destination is Kanakale, where a myth came to life. For 3,000 years, people believed that Homer's Iliad was fiction and that Troy never existed. In 1863, everything changed. Expatriate Frank Calvert discovered ancient ruins in western Turkey. He was convinced they belonged to the ancient city of Troy. Heinrich Schliemann examined this area in 1868. That's when Troy saw sunlight again after all those centuries. Troy has complex layers. Over the years, nine ancient cities were built on top of one another. Historians say that the area was strategically located between Europe and Asia, so it became a prosperous trade and cultural center. This strategic position made Troy attractive throughout history. After the Trojan conflict, the city was abandoned between the years 1100 to 700 BCE. Then Greek settlers rediscovered the area, and Alexander the Great ruled there. The Romans then invaded the city. Speaking of this event, the first thing you would see when visiting the site is a replica of the wooden Trojan horse from a movie shot in 2004. The next stop is Lothal. In the 1950s, Lothal and several other Harappan sites were discovered in India. These new provinces extended the boundaries of the Indus Valley civilization. Lothal was an important part of the Harappan civilization. It had vast cotton and rice fields. Plus, it had a bead-making factory. Beads were made from semi-precious stones, like agate. Many of these beads were later found in Mesopotamia, which serves as evidence that Lothal was a thriving trading port. Archaeologists believe that the city was part of an ancient trade route. Traces of agriculture? Check. Traces of trade? Check. What else? The remains of residential buildings, streets, bathing pavements, and drains some real city planning, and impressive examples of early urbanization. The town was well constructed. There were modern houses. Some of them had six rooms, bathrooms, a large courtyard, and even a veranda. Lothal also had the world's oldest known dock. It linked the city with the Sabarmati River and the trade route. 
The ancient Mayan city of Calakmul is located in southern Mexico in the tropical forest of the Tierras Bajas. From 500 CE to 800 CE, Calakmul was home to over 50,000 people. There was a central plaza surrounded by outer districts. And if we count both the inhabitants of all those outer areas and those who lived in the center, Calakmul had a population of more than 1.5 million people. It was a city that was habitable for 12 centuries. It's believed that the place had more constructions than any other excavated Maya settlements in the region. After 1000 CE, the Maya civilization there faced a downfall. The settlement that was once the center of Mesoamerica was almost completely abandoned. The ancient city was at the heart of the second largest tropical forest in America. The site is well preserved, so today, if you were to visit it, you would be able to picture what life looked like in ancient Mayan times. The city remains include architectural complexes and sculpted monuments, defensive systems, quarries, water management features, agricultural terraces, massive temple pyramids, and palaces. Not to mention a variety of body ornaments and other accompanying objects. It proves that complex state-organized societies lived in this tropical forest. The Mayans depicted nature in their paintings, pottery, sculptures, rituals, and even food. I'm moving on to a place people thought didn't really exist. The city of Thonis Heracleon appeared only in a few inscriptions and ancient texts. Turns out, it was waiting to be discovered for thousands of years. Scientists searched the majority of the coast of Egypt. But then, archaeologist Frank Gaudio and his team detected a colossal face looking at them from under the water. The ancient city of Heracleion was discovered completely submerged four miles off Alexandria's coast. In the ruins of the lost city, there were 64 ships, 700 anchors, and a treasure trove of gold coins. Archaeologists consider a 16-foot tall statue and the temple remains the most important findings discovered by the expedition. Back then, the city had ceremonies and celebrations that took place in the Temple of Amun. The ruins and artifacts were made from granite and diorite, so they were in good condition even after having been in contact with water for centuries. They give people a glimpse into what life was like 2,300 years ago in one of the most important trade ports of the world. The city had a network of canals. You can think of it as an ancient Egyptian Venice. The canals linked many separate harbors and anchorages. Towers, temples, houses, and other structures were also linked by bridges. Thonis Heracleion was the country's main port for international trade and the collection of taxes. No one really knows how the city ended up submerged, but archaeologists connect it with natural causes. At the end of the second century BCE, most probably after a flood, Heracleion got covered with water. Then, Alexandria, the city founded by Alexander the Great, became more glorious than Heracleion. Before Alexandria's fame, Heracleion was the main port of entry to Egypt. So, after the disaster, many ships heading for Heracleion had to change their route and go to Alexandria. Heracleion lost its glory until its rediscovery in 1933. Mesa Verde is an American national park in Colorado. The park is the largest archaeological preserve in the U.S., with more than 5,000 sites, including 600 cliff dwellings. Mesa Verde means green table in Spanish. The name comes from the shape of the mountains in the area, with flat tops and steep sides. The park is an ancestral Puebloan archaeological site. Starting from 7500 BCE, a group of nomadic Paleo-Indians seasonally lived in Mesa Verde. They were hunters, gatherers, and crop farmers. They built the first Pueblos in the region. By the end of the 12th century, the Mesa Verdeans began constructing massive cliff dwellings, which are now the best-known structures